Section 12 of The Spirit of American Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jessica Louise. The Spirit of American Literature by John Albert Macy. Thoreau. When Thoreau died, Emerson wrote, the country knows not yet, or in the least part, how great a son it has lost. In fifty years the country, the world, has learned more of this great son. Friends and editors have assembled one by one the eleven volumes of the standard edition, and the recent publication of his complete journal indicates that there are readers who regard the least of his notes as worthy of preservation. The growing cult of the open air the increasing host of amateur prodigals returning to nature, have given fresh vogue to his sketches of woods and waters. But for all that, the man is not yet fully understood. Lowell's unsympathetic essay, product of a mind from which poetry and youth had evaporated, and of a social outlook grown conventionally decorous, has carried inevitable authority. Like Macaulay's essay on Bacon and Jeffrey's blundering and miscomprehension of Wordsworth, it is an example of how one great reputation may for a period smother and distort another. Stevenson's popular essay, written in his half-dramatic attitude of athletic good cheer and arm-in-arm -arm sympathy with a hooray-boy world, is based on a misconception of Thoreau's character and his message as a whole. It overemphasizes the gentle reservation with which Emerson tempers his praise. Emerson, in a few words, sets forth the rounded integrity of Thoreau's work and personality. In one place he makes a comment upon his fellow philosopher's proneness to negation and opposition. The comment, in its place, is just to Thoreau and expresses Emerson's more inclusive amiability. Stevenson singles out from Emerson's total estimate the negative characteristic, and stiffens it into an antisocial asceticism which is not foreign to Thoreau's nature, but is by no means its dominant quality. That original minds stand above the comprehension of mediocre minds of their own period and of later times is a fact observable everywhere in the history of the human intellect. More than that, some minds are not merely above the common herd, they are in advance of the best culture of their day, and must await the intelligence of later generations to give them full recognition. Emerson and Holmes were as comprehensible to their generation as to ours. Whitman and Thoreau were trailblazers. They went before to survey regions where later comers find a broad highway. Thoreau's vision shot beyond the horizon which bounded, and still bounds, the sight even of that part of the world which fancies itself liberal and emancipated. I am, says Thoreau, a poet, a mystic, and a transcendentalist. He was all that, and moreover he was an anarchist. He was the one anarchist of great literary power in a nation of slavish conformity to legalism, where obedience to statute and maintenance of order are assiduously inculcated as patriotic virtues by the social powers which profit from other people's docility. Walden and A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers have been accepted as classics. The essays on forest trees and wild apples were to be found in a school reader twenty-five years ago. But the ringing revolt of the essay on civil disobedience is still silenced under the thick respectability of our times. The ideas in it could not today be printed in the magazine which was for years owned by the publishers of Thoreau's complete works. Boston Back Bay would shiver. It would not do, really, to utter aloud Thoreau's ideas in a society whose leading university, Thoreau's alma mater, has recently ruled that the halls of the university shall not be open for persistent or systematic propaganda on contentious questions of contemporaneous social, economic, political, or religious interests. That is, let the university offer fifty courses in philosophy, history, and literature which is dead enough not to be dangerous to vested authority, but let it not take any part in philosophy, history, or literature which is in the making. 
the application of thoreau's principles to the injustices of our present political and industrial life would be condemned as disloyally un-american in the community where he lived and which is now owned body and soul factory and college by state street thoreau's intellectual kinsmen are not there for an adequate recognition of the value of thoreau's challenge to authority one turns to no living new englander but to that other solitary and indignant moralist tolstoy on the right of the individual to withhold his sanction of word and deed from a government by any minority or majority which is engaged in dishonest practices and enforces brutal laws the american and the russian philosopher are mainly in accord each says to government you may take me and break me because you are physically strong but willing party to your legalized system of plunder and murder i will not be the government against which tolstoy rebelled is melodramatically barbarous so that liberal minds all over the world find themselves in sympathy with him it is easy to protest against tyranny on the other side of the planet thoreau's government which is so like the present government of the united states that the change of a word or two the insertion of modern instances makes his essay as pertinent as if written yesterday thoreau's government skulks behind the pacific mask of democracy it deforms children kills men and ruins women by common consent and not by the cossack forces of a picturesquely tyrannous czar the prosperous and so-called cultivated classes who manage for us our industrial educational literary and religious affairs hold up horrified hands at russia but naturally have no quarrel with the system of government at home which leaves them in peace and offers them a career of ease therefore in the gallery of ideas through which admiring american youth is conducted thoreau's portrait of government is discreetly turned to the wall his nature books his poetic notes on the seasons are recommended to an ever-growing number of readers the flaming eloquence of his social philosophy the significance the conclusion of his experiment in individualism is ignored we praise tolstoy even in cultivated boston but we remain unacquainted with our own spiritual liberator one difference between tolstoy and thoreau is vital a difference in personal circumstances tolstoy was born a landed aristocrat he struggled in vain to bring the conduct of his life into accord with his beliefs he desired to be a workman but could only dabble in manual toil in spite of his attempt to renounce copyright his world-famous fictions brought money to his family circumstances enmeshed him and his titanic struggle to extricate himself entangled him more and more and made him a tragic figure his life came to an impotent conclusion only death as in some greek tragedy could restore dignity and moral consistency thoreau on the other hand was born poor he remained a bachelor he earned his living by productive labor and thus he had the good fortune to be able to practice his philosophy he was not directly nor by any economic indirection dependent for his bread on another man tolstoy an agonized prisoner in a wealth which he thought polluted him may well have envied the yankee pencil whittler and land surveyor a jack of all trades and master of several who did his honest day's work beside the common laborers of the world the leisure which he spent in the company of sages poets and prophets whose peer he was he earned with his hands he was spared the humiliation of writing sermons on freedom in time won at the expense of some other man's freedom if i devote myself to other pursuits and contemplations he says i must first see at least that i do not pursue them sitting upon another man's shoulders i must get off him first that he may pursue his contemplations too one other difference between tolstoy and thoreau is essential it springs from that primary difference in their social stations tolstoy groaned beneath the agony of a suffering world he took upon himself the sins of his class his long cry of pain which the work of his last twenty years hurls at the dull ears of humanity is unrelieved except by a sad half-rationalized christianity confessedly unconsoling he tortured himself with an almost morbid sense of responsibility for evils remote from his private duties evils which he could not help thoreau on the contrary enjoyed life i came into this world he says not chiefly to make this a good place to live in but to live in it be it good or bad 
when they put him in jail for refusing on principle to pay his poll tax he had nothing on which to impose a property tax he did not make a martyr of himself but with his mouth slightly awry wrote five dryly humorous pages about my prisons in which legal contrivances are made to look not merely oppressive but ridiculous he laughs at the jailer and official his neighbors in their attitudes as policeman and soldier a man of humor one might think would be ashamed to appear on a street in thoreau's town in blue uniform with a star on his breast lest thoreau emerge suddenly from the woods and contemplate the insignia of authority with a faintly acid smile thoreau is not a theorist who argues himself into anarchism by the routes of bookish reasoning the philosophy of anarchism was not in his lifetime so highly developed codified and rationalized as it is now and it is doubtful if thoreau would have had much patience with its elaborately systematic arguments in support of an unsystematic conduct of life to speak practically and as a citizen he says unlike those who call themselves no government men i ask for not at once no government but at once a better government he was no selfish opponent of the inconveniences of society the state might have his money if it used it for useful or at worst harmless enterprises such as building roads he was willing to conform with any peaceful nonsense or extravagance one cannot be too much on his guard lest his action be biased by obstinacy or an undue regard for the opinions of men he simply asked not to be made accessory to legalized crime he had no disposition to reform the world though he joined the abolitionists like all decent new englanders of all creeds and political principles the government does not concern me much and i shall bestow the fewest possible thoughts on it that was a fair and a practical attitude for a free man in an agricultural nation like america sixty years ago where he who had skill to work could get a living somehow a complexly organized industrial system has since grown up in america all the good land is occupied or at least fenced with titles and to-day even so capable a man as thoreau would find it difficult to support himself in decency with a half day's work thoreau's views fitted his time and his community tolstoy holding the same views fifty years later was trying to hark back to conditions that the world of production had outlived even in russia what thoreau the maker of pencils would say to a modern pencil factory where he like other workmen would have to apply for a job or make no pencils we can only guess yankee wise we guess that he would have understood it shrewdly and inspected its machinery with the eye of a born mechanic and not have protested against it as his epigon tolstoy protested against the advance of modern industry with the great changes that have come in the relations between a workman and his tools some of thoreau's single-handed individualism has grown obsolete so far forth as it concerns those practices of government and habits of society which have not appreciably altered or improved it remains a much-needed word of rebellion how does it become a man to behave toward this american government to-day i cannot for an instant recognize that political organization is my government which is the slave's government also for black slave which he means substitute white slave or child laborer and the sentence stands vividly pertinent to the blessed year nineteen twelve this people he said must cease to make war on mexico though it cost them their existence as a people substitute philippines for mexico and the sentence is part of many an honest man's belief this morning the standing army says thoreau is only an arm of the standing government the government itself which is only the mode which the people have chosen to execute their will is equally liable to be abused and perverted before the people can act through it witness the present mexican war the work of comparatively few individuals using the standing army as their tool was that written yesterday when under pretense of preserving law and order on the mexican frontier the financial powers in control of these united states investors and mexican securities sent an army of free-born american soldiers to the rio grande the entire essay on civil disobedience should be read by us timorous moderns to re-nerve us in time of abuse we have it seems lost the art of speaking so eloquently and courageously but we can make the most of a man who spoke for us sixty years ago and whose work it is respectable to quote for he is an established new england classic 
thoreau was not concerned primarily with government because he was so situated that he could turn his back on it and not suffer in his time an independent man could enjoy liberty of utterance and occupation thoreau asked to be let alone and he was let alone non-interference between him and the government was mutual and friendly except when the tax collector reached his official hand into the conquered woods and seized that distinguished pole enumerated as h d thoreau occupation surveyor thoreau's work is a long notebook of surveyor's jottings a continuous journal all autobiographic some sections of which are assembled into essays his first book a week on the conquered and merrimack rivers consists of seven discursive essays on a multitude of subjects. There is rather more reflection upon literature and life in general than narrative of the week's experiences. This insurgent and original man who lives near the heart of nature, who like Whitman regards a woodchuck's hole as a cosmic fact, is a critic of literature, a reader of Elizabethan poets. In a later book, Cape Cod, he recites the sonorities of Homer on the Yankee Sands. In his first book he recites the beauties of nature reclining on the bosom of oriental religion and British poetry. On Saturday he paddles out on the river. The purling of the water, the echoes of civilization on the banks are vividly realized. But by Sunday morning the little stream has flown into the vasty deeps of Hindu and Greek philosophy, and when the Sabbath evening comes we have added nothing to our knowledge of local geography, but have listened to one of the very best essays on books. The paragraphs on style form one of the most melodious of all discourses on the art of expression. Thoreau exemplifies the art he is explaining. Whoever enjoys the inconsistency of man may note that for ten pages, in the skillful cadences of a practiced scholar, Thoreau dwells on the merit of the brief word, the eloquence of unlettered men, the farmer's call to his team, and other primitive, manly modes of speech. He pays his warmest tribute, however, not to the style of the conquered farmer, but to Sir Walter Raleigh. Sir Walter Raleigh might well be studied, if only for the excellence of his style, for he is remarkable in the midst of so many masters. There is a natural emphasis in his style, like a man's tread, and a breathing space between the sentences, which the best of modern writing does not furnish. His chapters are like English parks or say rather like a western forest, where the larger growth keeps down the underwood, and one may ride on horseback through the openings. All the distinguished writers of that period possess a greater vigor and naturalness than the more modern, for it is allowed to slander our own time. And when we read a quotation from one of them in the midst of a modern author, we seem to have come suddenly upon a greener ground, a greater depth and strength of soil. It is as if a green bough were laid across the page, and we are refreshed as by the sight of fresh grass in midwinter or early spring. You have constantly the warrant of life and experience in what you read. The little that is said is eked out by the implication of the much that was done. The word which is best said came nearest to not being spoken at all, for it is cousin to a deed which the speaker could have better done. Nay, almost it must have taken the place of a deed by some urgent necessity, even by some misfortune, so that the truest writer will be some captive knight after all. And perhaps the fates had some such design when, having stored Raleigh so richly with the substance of life and experience, they made him a fast prisoner, and compelled him to make his words his deeds and transfer to his expression the emphasis and sincerity of his action beautiful, fluent, and suggestive. But meanwhile, what has become of our village anarchist, whom even the tax collector cannot make a captive knight, but who is paddling idly on a New England river for a week? On Tuesday, a fine description of daybreak from a mountain, an experience not of this week, but of another year. On Wednesday, a fine sermon on friendship. On Thursday, the story of Hannah Dustin and her justifiably murderous exploit among the Indians, accompanied by a discourse on epic stories and history. On Friday, the wind blew steadily downstream so that we kept our sails set and lost not a moment of the forenoon by delays, but from early morning until noon were continually dropping downward. With our hands on the steering paddle, which was thrust deep into the river, 
or bending to the oar, which indeed we rarely relinquished, we felt each palpitation in the veins of our steed, and each impulse of the wings which drew us above. The current of our thoughts made as sudden bends as the river. And so he steers into a fine discussion of Ossian. He returns into the current to glide past Tingsborough and Chelmsford, holding in one hand half a tart country apple pie. Thence back into a beautiful eddy of thought about poetry, and the week is ended, a leisurely week covering ages of human thought. Footnote. Alcott said that this book was Virgil, White of Selborne, and Isaac Walton and Yankee Settler all in one. This is intended as high praise and does express the varied wealth of the book, but Alcott could not turn a lofty intention into words without getting something wrong. There is about as much of Virgil in Thoreau as there is of Seneca. End footnote. Of this interesting book, full of exquisite reflections and of as deep wisdom as ever came out of the universe by way of Concord, the author sold two hundred copies. The rest he took back from the printer and stored in a garret, a transaction which he records with unresentful dry humor. His next book, the only other which he lived to see in print, is Walden, his masterpiece, a greater book than the week, of the same tone and texture, but informed by a more explicit, unifying philosophy of life. It records his actual experiment in individualism. It is alive with the reality of daily doings and is rounded to a higher reality, to one man's complete view of the life worth living and the destiny of the race. Emerson, paying his frugal way by lecturing and writing, makes many observations about society and solitude, the place of the individual in nature, but he lives among men, and does not know from experience the effect of abiding soul and self-dependent in the midst of an unpopulated wood. Thoreau, investigator and surveyor, tries solitude for two years, makes nature a laboratory, and brings back the record of his experiment. Walden is one of those whole, profound books in which the best of an author is distilled. In his two years by the pond, Thoreau observed sharply what he could do with nature and what nature did to him. He pondered at leisure over what it all meant and made, not a collection of random jottings, but a summarized report. Thoreau does not, as some people imagine, argue the case for the wilderness as against the town. On the contrary, he loves best the cultivated land with people on it. He merely uses the wilderness to try himself in. He goes where the nature ingredients are unmixed with other things, as an experimenter in dietetics isolates his food squad to increase human knowledge, not to please their palates. Thoreau tells what he lived for, how he lived, and thereby throws light on what humanity lives for. His attitude is neither modest nor magisterial. It is sometimes rather disdainful, his reflections on the life that his neighbors lead are often coolly contemptuous. But for the most part he is setting forth his life, and makes his conclusions clear, without urging them upon the reader's acceptance. He probes into the economies of an unthinking prosperity, like other radical philosophers. But whereas the satiric dissections of a Carlyle leave the world a ruin, and the pieces not worth picking up, Thoreau builds a courageous and cheerfully remodeled life, practical for him at least, and though not to be foisted on the world like a farmer's nostrum, valuable to any neighbor who will read intelligently. So I lived, he seems to say, so I believed, so I found out and realized my sense of life, take it or leave it. My experience taught me that to build a fine house to live in is less important than to build a good man to live in it. If that is not a practical ideal, please examine my bean account and see if by your own dull bread-winning, cake-stealing standards of life I did not prove myself a competent husbandman. Thoreau does not turn his back on responsibilities nor flaunt his idleness in the sweaty face of humanity. He is a conscientiously busy man busy about his life and needs, and not unmindful of the needs of others. He holds his head up honestly, the equal of the thoughtless driven toiler, and is much his superior in the satisfaction of man's need for high meditation. The philosophy of Walden is near to the selfish self-culture of the unsocial Greek. States cannot be built on it any more than they can be built on Epictetus or on Plato's Republic, but like them, Thoreau stimulates the individual to examine himself and see where he stands in the midst of the solar system, to inquire what his activities amount to and what is the motive of them. 
there is more in walden than philosophy and unsocial experiment in the business of making a living it is full of the poetry of the open world an hypathro book unroofed to the skies the birds fly and sing and the trees bud sometimes they have their technical names for thoreau is too clever to know less about a thing he sees than does some commonplace naturalist of the schools but a naturalist he avowedly is not he says in his journal that the secretary of the association for the advancement of science asked him to fill in the blanks of a circular letter by way of answering certain questions among which the most important one was what branch of science i was especially interested in i felt that it would be to make myself a laughing-stock of the scientific community to describe to them that branch of science which especially interests me inasmuch as they do not believe in a science which deals with the higher law how absurd that though i probably stand as near to nature as any of them and am by constitution as good an observer as most yet a true account of my relation to nature should excite their ridicule only again he writes in the journal man cannot afford to be a naturalist to look at nature directly but with only the side of his eye he must look through and beyond her to look at her is as fatal as to look at the head of medusa it turns the man of science to stone thoreau is as he prayed to be a hunter of the beautiful he is in league with the stones of the field and the beasts of the field are at peace with him he is a better naturalist than most men of literary imagination and he has more imagination than most naturalists there are two kinds of mystics one shrouds himself in his cloudy dreams mistaking his murky vision for fact the other open-eyed and cheerful amid the sunlit world feels himself near the heart of living things the one is a theologian the other is a poet for all his interest in the hazier transcendentalists and his admiration for the stupendous absurdities of swedenborg thoreau is less near to the religious mystic than to the nature poet of all times and especially to wordsworth thoreau's spirit is that of a poet though his verses are not good for he was wanting in the decisive gift of lyrical expression as emerson says of plato and might have said of himself like his contemporaries thoreau misreads nature as a collection of moral lessons but he is not blind to her naked loveliness and he finds her lessons not austere but consoling not by constraint or severity shall you have access to true wisdom but by abandonment and childlike mirthfulness if you would know aught be gay before it mystic and transcendentalist he is not a foggy-minded dreamer with his head lost in vacant unrealities he lived not ascetically but heartily and could have said on his deathbed like hazlitt that he had had a happy life he did not shrink from facts like some other poets who have fled stricken to the shadowy woods he looked upon things courageously but he had his private criteria of what was worth looking at his quarrel with politicians is characteristic he is contemptuous of them not because they are engaged in sordid matters not because they are practical the sentimentalist charge against them but because they are not earnestly busy at the tasks they pretend to engage in they are poor politicians they who have been bred in the school of politics fail now and always to face the facts he says in his wonderful essay life without principle he says i have often been surprised when one has with confidence proposed to me a grown man to embark in some enterprise of his as if i had absolutely nothing to do my life having been a complete failure hitherto no no i am not without employment at this stage of the voyage to tell the truth i saw an advertisement for able-bodied seamen when i was a boy sauntering in my native port and as soon as i came of age i embarked so he sailed a clear-eyed steersman content and confident as in the canoe which he paddled on concord river to that morrow the concluding words of walden which mere lapse of time can never make to dawn the light which puts out our eyes is darkness to us only that day dawns to which we are awake there is more day to dawn the sun is but a morning star biographical note henry david thoreau was born in concord massachusetts july twelfth eighteen seventeen and died there may sixth eighteen sixty two he graduated at harvard in eighteen thirty seven in those days there was a fee of five dollars for the diploma and thoreau who had an unusually good sense of values refused to pay the price of the parchment he spent the rest of his life in and about concord 
whence he made excursions to Cape Cod, Maine, New Hampshire, Canada. He supported himself by teaching school, making lead pencils, surveying, and farming. He gave a few lectures and published two books. Emerson expresses his life in compact negations. He was bred to no profession, he never married, he lived alone, he never went to a church, he never voted, he refused to pay a tax to the state, he ate no flesh, he drank no wine, he never knew the use of tobacco, and, though a naturalist, he used neither gun nor rod. It should be added that he did not always live alone, for he lived with Emerson a little while, paying his board by his labor. Emerson edited four of his posthumous volumes. His works are A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, 1849, Walden, 1854, Excursions, 1863, The Maine Woods, 1864, Cape Cod, 1865, Letters, 1865, A Yankee in Canada, 1866, Early Spring in Massachusetts, 1881, Summer, 1884, Winter, 1887, Autumn, 1892, Miscellanies, 1893, Journals, edited by Bradford Torrey, 1906. The Life of Thoreau is written in his journals and letters with the admirable introductions by his friends, Emerson and Mr. F. B. Sanborn. The life by his other friend, W. E. Channing, called Thoreau, Poet Naturalist, is important but fatuous. A good English biography is that by H. A. Page, Dr. Alexander Japp, Thoreau, His Life and Aim. Stevenson's essay in Familiar Studies of Men and Books is good Stevenson but poor Thoreau, and the paragraphs about the essay in the preface are just as good Stevenson but still worse Thoreau. Lowell's essay is the work of an extraordinarily brilliant snob. See also the life by H. S. Salt and the life by F. B. Sanborn in American Men of Letters. End of section 12. Recording by Jessica Louise, St. Paul, Minnesota. Section 13 of The Spirit of American Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. The Spirit of American Literature by John Albert Macy. Section 13. Lowell. Chapter 11. Lowell. There is Lowell, whose striving Parnassus to climb, with a whole bale of isms tied together with rhyme. He might get on alone, spite of brambles and boulders, but he can't with that bundle he has on his shoulders. The top of the hill he will ne'er come nigh reaching, till he learns the distinction twixt singing and preaching. His lyre has some chords that would ring pretty well, but he'd rather by half make a drum of the shell, and rattle away till he's old as Methuselah at the head of a march to the last new Jerusalem. In this lampoon of himself, in the clattering fable for critics, Lowell confesses one of his defects and he exhibits another, his verbal carelessness and lack of metrical finesse. He also displays very attractive virtues, a genial willingness to apply his critical candor to his own talents, and freedom from the more solemn sort of literary pose. He began his career with some slight verses, sincere in thought and not unskillful, though technically stiff and hasty with the haste that betrays itself. He was moved, at least in his youth, by noble enthusiasms. He studied the poets, ancient and modern, with unfeigned ardor. He became a competent, even acute analyst of the technique of poetry. His impulse to utter his feelings in song did not abate with youth, but continued all his life. Yet he wrote no perfect poem in classic English, if classic is the word to discriminate what is not in dialect. No poem of his sings itself, flies on its own wings, or, to use its own words, maintains itself by virtue of a happy coalescence of matter and style. 
the old way of expressing his failure is to say that he was not a born poet which explains nothing but suggests what is wanting in the verse of a man who had most of the nameable abilities and motives that make a poet lifelong devotion to poetry an unusually wide acquaintance with the resources of language elevated thoughts and an intense desire to say them all are his the music simply does not happen it is not the burden of his isms alone that keeps him on the lower paths of parnassus milton coleridge shelley were heavily laden with intellectual theses the glorious company of pre-raphaelites often set up a lecture stand in their airy to engage in a bewildering babble of disputes on social political and aesthetic problems poets are thinkers and are not inferior to their prosaic brothers in their love of argument or the zeal with which they hug their opinions a true poet can carry any intellectual burden and not be hindered by it lowell had no quality no interest no occupation chosen or enforced which might not be of real service to a poet no pack of fardels bound him to earth his disability was not a positive but a negative thing he was profoundly ambitious he took his work seriously and felt deeply what he had to say in an early poem an incident in a railroad car he describes the effect of burns on simple men the poem rings true it is free from the sentimentalism of bret harte's poem on a similar subject dickens in camp but better far it is to speak one simple word which now and then shall waken their free nature in the weak and friendless sons of men to write some earnest verse or line which seeking not the praise of art shall make a clearer faith and manhood shine in the untutored heart this is an excellent ideal sincerely if not poetically said it expresses what whittier and longfellow did in some measure accomplish lowell does not reach the untutored heart nor does he satisfy readers whose private anthology is gathered from three centuries of english poetry he did enjoy a degree of popularity that any poet might be proud of his stirring piece the present crisis was quoted by the liberal preachers and orators of the day its fluent declamation adapts it to the impassioned eloquence of exhorters striving to rouse multitudes the vision of sir launfal became a household poem and is still perhaps not wisely prescribed for reading in american secondary schools the best of all his verse except that in dialect is the passage about lincoln in the commemoration ode it is so good that it ought to be great but the light fades from it when it is put beside whitman's elegies the ode was written in a rush of inspiration which left lowell exhausted a true case of the poet's pouring his heart's blood that is his nervous energy into his work but it leaves at least one reader who is eager to like it almost cold the metaphors shine but do not glow lowell's strong capricious intellect seems not to have guided firmly the flow of his emotion but to have intercepted it and diluted it with rhetoric and conceits some of his other high-pitched and sober verse intended to be in the grand style and strong with the very effort to be poetry is confused and perplexing the metaphors are manufactured and inserted they are not of one substance with the thought turner's old temeraire which should have been a fine poem ends this shall the pleased eyes of our children see for this the stars of god long even as we earth listens for his wings the fates expectant lean faith cross-propped waits and the tired waves of thoughts insurgent see that verse with its teeth gritting faith cross-propped waits is like the unpoetic parts of browning the work of a capable intellect pushing the words into place with great power far above the capacity of the mere mediocre versifier but not making poetry the inevitable poem is so good that it cannot be made essentially better 
it is great with its defects like francis thompson's unrevised in no strange land it is so good that it does not remind one of another poem which in its kind surpasses it it becomes indispensable to the lover of poetry who once reads it and nothing else will take its place the themes of lowell's poems in pure english are all sung better by some other poet in appledore one cannot hear the sea as one hears it in swinburne and whitman the washers of the shroud does not thrill with the ominous voice of war it is intellectually interesting and has like much of lowell's verse every virtue but the virtue hunger and cold is startling and virile especially the beginning it diminishes into mere stanza making and you can hear the pen scratch bibliolatries has a good thought in it a protest of the modern spirit against letter-bound creeds slowly the bible of the race is writ and not on paper leaves nor leaves of stone each age each kindred adds a verse to it texts of despair or hope of joy or moan while swings the sea while mists the mountain shroud while thunders surges burst on cliffs of cloud still at the prophet's feet the nations sit such pregnant verses have value they rise eminent in the solid prose of life but do not detach from it and become poetry talent says lowell is that which is in a man's power genius is that in whose power he is this epigram belongs to a time when philosophic critics were wrestling with definitions trying to mark the exact boundaries of talent and genius wit and humor imagination and fancy it is a kind of philosophizing that we seem to have abandoned partly because the men of the early nineteenth century handed down to us as a result of their labors a precise critical vocabulary and partly because they left the disputes inconclusive and so taught us that they cannot be settled that epigram is too sharp to be true but it has truth in it and it is applicable to lowell's verse he had poetic talent the genius of poetry did not possess him lowell says that a wise skepticism is the first attribute of a good critic the skepticism which with an honest willingness to be persuaded that lowell is a poet comes off still shaking its head may not be wise and the critic may not be a good critic but it is better than ungenuine praise and high praise it is impossible to give to the verse that lowell wrote in traditional literary english there is however one portion of his poetry which completely overcomes skepticism and for which nothing but praise can be spoken the bigelow papers they have no rivals custom has not staled them occasional poems they have wings that lift them above occasion to immortality in them lowell is possessed by his genius by a genius that never visited any one else in the same shape the dialect artificial from the point of view of a philological naturalist becomes lowell's native speech in it he can say anything grotesque scornful flippant deeply comic pathetic gay blithely lyrical melancholy he is much more at ease in it than in the language of his library the courton is his best poem and far from being homely it is as graceful as a handsome girl in a gingham apron in the bigelow papers all of lowell's metrical gymnastics his jovial crackling wit his passionate manly convictions are brought into full play he is dead in earnest and yet having a good time so thoroughly is lowell's whole self embodied in this form that having made the mexican war series he can after fifteen years under the impulse of the civil war resume the vernacular liar and a rare thing make the sequel better than its predecessor a new englander can read the bigelow papers aloud with hardly more consciousness that he is reading a dialect than an educated scotsman probably feels in reading burns to say that it is a dialect that no people ever spoke is merely to say that new englanders do not talk in verse neither would a scotch farmer before burns have said 
a woe-worn gaist i hameward glide for that is the idiom not of speech but of literature reshaping a dialect bigelow's turn of phrase falls familiar on the ear of one who knows new england farmers farmers that did leave the axe and saw the anvil and the plough who believe that the best way to settle is to settle and not jaw and then argue an hour to prove it lowell's enthusiasm for the dialect and his delight in the yankee mixture of common sense and mystic nearness to god find expression in the essay which prefaces the collected works of mr bigelow and parson wilbur can the literature of philology show such a truly literary and genuinely philological essay as lowell's he knows the subject as a scholar and feels it as a poet the dialect is his most effective literary idiom in it he can let himself go and he is freed from the weight of his bookishness contrast his expression in classic english and in bigelow's dialect of ideas nearly akin the loss of his children moved him to write several poems she came and went the changeling and the first snowfall he also wrote some verses on the death of a friend's child and on the death of agassiz lowell was too honest to write of his private emotions merely for the sake of making verses yet none of these poems is affecting in the way they intend to be indeed one dislikes to quote them even to prove a point because they produce a feeling of discomfort of regret that a strong man tragically meaning what he tries to say should speak like a feeble sentimentalist i had a little daughter and she was given to me to lead me gently backward to the heavenly father's knee after the war in which lowell lost three nephews hoses bigelow sings his joy at the coming of peace and his sorrow for dead soldiers rat tat tattle through the street i hear the drummers makin riot and i set thinkin o the feet that follered once and now are quiet white feet is snowdrops innercent that never knowed the paths of satan whose comin step there's ears that won't no not life long leave off a waitin why hain't i held em on my knee didn't i love to see em growin three likely lads as well could be handsome and brave and not too knowin i set and look into the blaze whose nature just like theirn keeps climbin as long's it lives in shinin ways and half despise myself for rhymin what's words to them whose faith and truth on war's red touchstone rang true metal who ventured life and love and youth for the great prize of death and battle to him who deadly hurt again flashed on afore the charge's thunder dippin with fire the bolt of men that rived the rebel line asunder tain't right to have the young go first all throbbin full of gifts and graces leavin life's paupers dry as dust to try and make believe to fill their places nothin but tells us what we miss there's gaps our lives can't never fay in and that world seems so fur from this left for us loafers to grow gray in in the lighter sharper moods of satire the bigelow papers are so good that they are all quotable the peace society might open offices next to our recruiting stations with their mendacious posters of splendidly tailored officers and distribute to inquiring youth the first effusion of mr bigelow thrash away you'll have to rattle on them kittle drums o' yorn tain't a knowin kind of cattle that is ketched with mouldy corn put in stiff you fifer fellow let folks see how spry you be guess you'll toot till you're yeller fore you get a hold o me that air flag's a little rotten hope it ain't your sunday best fact it takes a sight o cotton to stuff out a soldier's chest since we farmers have to pay for it if you must wear humps like these supposin you should try salt hay for it it would do as slick as grease to our cowardly newspapers which do not dare fight or even mention injustices at their own doors because the owners of the papers or their financial allies make money out of the injustices the pious editor's creed is recommended 
I do believe in freedom's cause, as fur away as Paris is. I love to see her stick her claws in them infernal Pharisees. It's well enough agin a king to draw resolves and triggers, but liberty's a kind of thing that don't agree with niggers. I do believe in special ways of prayin' and convertin'. The bread comes back in many days, and buttered too, for certain. I mean in prayin' till one busts on what the party chooses, and in convertin' public trusts to very private uses. I do believe in bein' this or that, as it may happen, one way or t'other hendiest is to catch the people nappin'. It ain't by principles nor men my prudent course is steadied. I sent which pays the best, and then go into it bald-headed. Something in the pastoral line is a fine nature poem. The coming of spring is as fresh as Chaucer's April. Gladness on wings, the bobolink is here. Half hid in tip-top apple blooms he swings, or climbs against the breeze with quiverin' wings, or given way to it in mock despair, runs down a brook of laughter through the air. If Lowell, with his full hearty sense of life and many gifts, did not write any book except the Bigelow Papers, which takes its place surely among the classics, did he phrase the reason himself in these lines? Just so with poets, what they've early read gets kind of worked into their heart and head, so's they can't seem to write but just on shears with furrin countries or played out ideas nor have a feelin' if it doesn't smack o' what some critter chose to feel way back. Did not Lowell read too much? Did not his vigorous mind become smothered in more traditional ideas than it could assimilate and master? As he grows older he becomes distrustful of life. He does not lead but follows, and skeptically, timidly opposes the newer movements, just as the older ideas which his youth welcomed were opposed by men whom he then as a hot radical despised his mind seems to fill up too quickly and have no room left for anything that happened after the civil war he is afraid of evolution clinging with a perverse sentimentality to pretty beliefs that he has really outgrown in waxing rigid with age he is not unlike other men many of his contemporaries seem to have been stunned tired out by the issues of the civil war unable to take up thoughts not already in their blood by the time he is fifty all of lowell's interest is in ideas that have already ripened and partly decayed and the reason with him over and above the conservatism natural to graying maturity is that he fed himself too richly on things in old books his biography portrays him hurrying home from lectures, half ironically congratulating himself for having overcome his indolence and done a day's work, then incontinently sinking into his armchair and reading till midnight. He had a capacious and hospitable mind. He boasted that in 1860 he was one of the few cultivated Bostonians who appreciated Lincoln and foresaw his emerging greatness. Twenty years later, he is looking at life with the shrug of the mere literary man. He has degenerated into a polite, conservative statesman, intelligent, honest, but no longer alive to the best and bravest ideas of the life about him. He himself is in the past. His mind was crammed with literature, that is, with the expressions of outworn states of society, and even his large nature had no room for anything fresh from life. Literature is a food and a stimulant, up to a certain point. Beyond that it becomes a drug. By thirty-five or forty, a creative literary intellect should have taken its necessary nutriment from the classics. After that, much reading maketh not a full man but a library man. Lowell's essay on Lincoln, written in 1864, when people needed to be told what we know now, but few knew then, is a greater contribution to literature, to the life of humanity, than essays on Dante and Chaucer. One is jealous in behalf of real literature at the surrender of such a splendid mind as Lowell's to the inferior work, the secondary work, of studying books. 
that work which is necessary and requires talent can be well enough done by men who could not write the bigelow papers or the essay on lincoln moreover less reading the study of fewer men would not have hurt his bookish essays but might have improved them he quotes too much directly and indirectly transfers to his pages in too great abundance and to the disturbance of order the marked passages in his beloved library lowell's submersion in books was to be sure not motivated entirely by the sin of indolence and willingness to let other men determine the course of his thought he was devoted to great thinkers and his devotion is more than justified by the work he did as a teacher and critic in company with longfellow emerson and others of the new england illuminati he introduced modern literature into a cultivated society that had hitherto depended wholly on the ancient classics the classics parsed and parsonified to put it in a lowellian manner his address delivered before the modern language association is a sort of intellectual autobiography a confession of faith and apologia pro vita sua the man who objected to the stuffed nightingales in english aprils in american poetry was the man who swamped himself and others in floods of european literature it was a true service which we might easily underestimate to-day when the literature of every country is exported to every other as fast as it comes from the press when lowell opened the old french romances he found virgin pages the gilt and marbling on the tops of the books stuck the leaves together with his characteristic skill in finding just the right quotation to express it he says i was the first who ever burst into that silent sea he was a discoverer and his critical essays tingle with the fervor of discovery to-day our poor professors are driven to despair trying to keep up with the literature of their subjects which is not literature at all and they look at you wistfully enviously if you happen to talk about some great modern things which they teachers of literature have not time for lowell made his reading fruitful for other men therefore he is a true critic he did his work at a time when it was greatly needed yet one cannot help thinking that he was reading other men's work when he ought to have been rewriting his own that another poem as good as the courton and better versions of many of his other poems got lost in the library where there was so much french romance and dante and chaucer one poem is worth fifty criticisms arnold's lovely poem the buried life is more precious than all his talks about the function of criticism and hellenism lowell's position was unique he was the sole authentic literary advocate and discoverer in new england and had no competitors near his throne longfellow also a discoverer and advocate did not write criticisms lowell's autocratic privileges fostered the merits of his prose its humanity audacity colloquial ease and it also aggravated his defects his amateurish capricious irresponsibility which his finer tempered friend norton and his more learned friend child could not chasten if they ever tried to he could give his judgments without any feeling that there was a law library at his back or any other competent lawyer in the courtroom on the whole this condition was rather for than against the kind of excellence of which he was capable he needed elbow-room and a willful laxity of method circumstances encouraged him to be an amateur in the best sense of the word reading for fun like lamb not worried about the duty of getting up his subject and so never losing in the judgment seat the reader's attitude toward books his address to the modern language association once an encouragement is now a rebuke to the college professor of comparative literature a subject which has become all comparison and no literature if i may judge by such living professors as i have listened to or read if i did not rejoice says lowell in the wonderful advance made in the comparative philology of the modern languages i should not have the face to be standing here but neither should i if i shrank from saying what i believed to be the truth whether here or elsewhere i think that the purely linguistic side in the teaching of them 
seems in the way to get more than its fitting share i insist only that in our college courses this should be a separate study and that good as it is in itself it should in the scheme of general instruction be restrained to its own function as the guide to something better and that something better is literature let us rescue ourselves from what milton calls these grammatic flats and shallows the blossoms of language have certainly as much value as its roots for if the roots secrete food and thereby transmit life to the plant yet the joyous consummation of that life is in the blossoms which alone bear the seeds that distribute and renew it in other growths exercise is good for the muscles of mind and to keep it well in hand for work but the true end of culture is to give it play a thing quite as needful as an amateur enjoying himself in a wide range of literature lowell sometimes misjudges many commonplace instructors in english could point out where he was wrong but they are wrong too and are not interesting as mr ambrose bierce said of one of them professor matthews is nothing if not accurate and he is not accurate what difference does it make if lowell is wrong in his contention about chaucer's nine-syllable line the significant thing is that no other american professor not even child with all his knowledge has written an essay on chaucer which like lowell's is itself literature lowell illuminates even where he misjudges and therein he differs from critics who write with such modified judgments and well-tempered compensations that they elaborately kill their discourses lowell's essay on thoreau is unjust but even one who regards thoreau as very great will find himself unable to improve upon lowell's praises on the last atoning page there are sentences of his as perfect as anything in the language and thoughts as clearly crystallized his metaphors and images are always fresh from the soil he had watched nature like a detective who is to go upon the stand as we read him it seems as if all out of doors had kept a diary and become its own montaigne we look at the landscape as in a claude lorraine glass compared with his all other books of similar aim even white selborne seem dry as a country clergyman's meteorological journal in an old almanac he belongs with dunn and brown and novalis if not with the originally creative men with the scarcely smaller class who are peculiar and whose leaves shed their invisible thought seeds like ferns the opening pages of the same essay are an acid caricature of a whole era of thought and are good reading if not taken too seriously they are written by a man who is more than a literary critic who is a satirist of human nature the same satirist who wrote the double-edged commentaries of hosea's friend the rev homer wilbur lowell's essay on carlyle measures exactly the place in nineteenth-century thought that now looking back we can see carlyle had come to at that time if some readers of modern poetry have fallen out with pope lowell's essay will incite them to read pope again and learn his unique excellence the paper on a certain condescension in foreigners is ultimate criticism of all books by all people especially englishmen on countries where the writers do not live lowell has the true essayist's inability to stick to his subject apropos of a book or a writer he talks of anything that happens to be suggested to him this quality makes him an excellent letter writer and as his friends report him a delightful talker natural king in the easy-chair throne some formalistic critics who seem to think that the whole universe of literature depends on their saying just the right thing object too strongly to lowell's habit of kicking up his heels in the midst of a fine passage lamb the greatest of critics does the same thing it comes from irrepressible high spirits delight in life which is a good thing in literature and is correspondingly good in the criticism of literature no other writer about books after lamb and hazlitt is more continuously readable than lowell his very prejudices are entertaining 
they lead him to some bold hard-hitting which we are told passed out of good society with the days of macaulay and poe perhaps that is the reason some of us read macaulay and poe in preference to critics of finer amenity lowell always talks like an honest man never like a literary poser his affectations are not really affectations for he expects you to know what he is doing to play act with him in a momentary interruption before he goes on again with the lesson in hand he tells what books mean to him not what they ought to mean to him because some other critic has said so he is capable of fine eloquence and he has a habit of bringing his eloquence quickly down by a whimsical change of mood he has variety of style because he has variety of feelings the irregularities of his prose are due not wholly to carelessness but partly to exuberance and to the impulsive pursuit of his idea all lowell's prose is good to read one volume of it is indispensable to an american the political essays we can read somebody else's essays on gray and keats but no one of the time has left us a better volume of its kind than lowell's papers on political affairs in eighteen eighty eight when he collected them he wrote in looking at them again after so long an interval for the latest of them is more than twenty years old it gratifies me to find so little to regret in their tone and that i was able to keep my head fairly clear of passion when my heart was at boiling point like mazzini and phillips lowell preaches god and the people later he clung to god but drew away from the people the foolish charge of anglomania once brought against him was a poor return for his adequate services in spain and england which he gave as a matter of conscience when he would rather have been back in his library but that charge is merely a wrong way of putting what is true that he had outlived his democracy he saw as he believed that the country was falling away from the ideals of lincoln and when he caricatured wendell phillips he did not see that he was taking a place analogous to that of cultivated gentlemen of an earlier time who wanted slavery let alone the hot heart and cool head that had enabled him to see lincoln in eighteen sixty four and served him in his fine dignified polemic on the seward johnson reaction ceased to work together it was a different man who in eighteen eighty six wrote the progress of the world which is a demonstration that one man in the world had ceased to progress he was no longer interested in the march toward any new jerusalem never again in the last quarter century was he so strong so truly the lowell of the bigelow papers as when he wrote in eighteen sixty eight we have only to be unswervingly faithful to what is the true america of our hope and belief and whatever is american will rise from one end of the country to the other instinctively to our side with more than ample means of present succor and of final triumph it is only by being loyal and helpful to truth that men learn at last how loyal and helpful she can be to them biographical note James Russell Lowell was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts, February 22, 1819. He died there August 12, 1891. He graduated from Harvard in 1838. For a while he studied law. In 1844 he married Maria White. She died in 1853. He spent the years 1851 to 1855 and 1856 in europe in 1857 he succeeded longfellow as smith professor of literature in harvard college and held the chair for fifteen years he married his second wife frances dunlap in 1857 he was the first editor of the atlantic monthly and in 1862 he became co-editor with charles Eliot norton of the north american review he was appointed minister to Spain in 1887, and was transferred to England in 1880. He was relieved of political duty in 1885, when Cleveland became president. His principal works are Poems, 1844-1848, Conversations on Some of the Old Poets, 1845, 
The Bigelow Papers, First Series, 1848. A Fable for Critics, 1848. Fireside Travels, 1864. Commemoration Ode, 1865. The Bigelow Papers, Second Series, 1866. Under the Willows, 1869. The Cathedral, 1869. Among My Books, 1870, 1876. My Study Windows, 1871. Three Memorial Poems, 1876. Democracy and Other Addresses, 1886. Heart's Ease and Rue, 1888. Political Essays, 1888. Latest Literary Essays and Addresses, 1891. The Old English Dramatists, 1892. Letters, edited by C. E. Norton, 1893. The Life of Lowell by Mr. Ferris Greenslet is authentic. Recollections and Appreciations by Francis H. Underwood and James Russell Lowell and His Friends by Dr. E. E. Hale are delightful and personal. A good essay is that by Mr. Henry James in Essays in London. End of Section 13 Lowell Section 14 of The Spirit of American Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Spirit of American Literature by John Albert Macy. Section 14. Whitman. Part 1. The singers are welcomed, understood, appear often enough. But rare has the day been, likewise the spot, of the birth of the maker of poems, the answerer. Rhymes and rhymers pass away, poems distilled from poems pass away. The swarms of reflectors and the polite pass and leave ashes. Admirers, importers, obedient persons make but the soil of literature. America justifies itself, given it time. No disguise can deceive it or conceal from it. It is impassive enough. Only the likes of itself will advance to meet it. If its poets appear, it will in due time advance to meet them. There is no fear of mistake. The proof of a poet shall be sternly deferred till his country absorbs him as affectionately as he has absorbed it. Only one day in the century of American literature is marked by the birth of a maker of poems, an answerer, the day when Whitman was born. The history of Whitman, of his poetry, and of the effect it has had on many kinds of men is a history of the slow advance of democracy to meet its poets or one of its poets for there shall be many when leaves of grass appeared in eighteen fifty five it was welcomed by a few great liberal spirits notably by emerson later whitman was hailed by some englishmen of letters including several of the young raphaelite group who were at once so daringly modern and so yearningly curious of the middle ages Conventional teachers of literature, professional book reviewers, whom Whitman openly challenged with his magnificent kindly scorn, quite naturally returned fire, and inevitably betrayed their impotence. A group of young Americans, then at the beginning of careers which have since made their names known, such as Mr. John Burroughs and Mr. Horace Traubel, formed a Whitman cult, whose devotion and nobility of thought more than atone for such partisan overemphasis as is characteristic of all militant discipleships a generation of british poets and radical thinkers who were young when leaves of grass was new for instance w e henley and edward carpenter have felt whitman's influence and been strengthened by it in true self-expression the present generation of young readers of poetry contains men who no more doubt that whitman is the greatest poetic voice of nature and liberty since wordsworth and shelley than they doubt that lincoln was the greatest statesman meanwhile the great public common humanity the average man whom whitman loved and knew better than did wordsworth or shelley or any other poet seems to deny its own prophet that is the multitude do not read him thereby negatively attesting that they hold him the equal of dante and milton whom also they do not read 
I bestow upon any man or woman, says Whitman, the entrance to all gifts of the universe, but many men and women do not accept this generosity. The indifference of democracy to its greatest poet seems a paradox, but the indifference does not exist. America is not a democracy. It is a vast bourgeoisie. The democracy which Whitman celebrates has not arrived on the earth. The men and women he saw and loved were the material of which he believed a democracy is some day to be born. So that when professors, deaf and blind to the life about them, and especially to democracy, which is as yet felt only by a minority, say that the ideals of the people are contrary to Whitman's ideals of the people, they are superficially right. The ideals of the people are bourgeois ideals inculcated by most of the savants in obedience to the economic powers that endow and dominate the universities. The democratic ideal, the ideal of Shelley, of Mazzini, of young Wagner, of Lincoln, corroborative passages are abundant in the writings of these apparently dissimilar men, has not yet reached the majority of the people. The middle class thinkers and teachers who manage our schools and our press are undemocratic and ignorant. It is true, as Professor George Santayana says, that Whitman failed radically in his dearest ambition, if his dearest ambition was to be read by the millions. But Whitman was no fool, did not expect in his lifetime to be read by a million people. Moreover, to say, as Professor Santayana says, that he can never be the poet of the people is a prophecy which, since one man has as much right as another to guess at the future, can be met with the contrary prophecy that Whitman will be one of the poets of the people when, and not until, democracy dominates this world. Then the people will advance to meet him. There is no fear of mistake. To say that democracy did not accept him is like saying that nature did not buy copies of Wordsworth poems or that the inhabitants of the infernal areas did not sit about reading Dante. Shelley and Morris, the greatest of all English poets of liberty, are not in the coat pockets of the workmen whose emancipation they chanted. The reviews of the year 1820 show that the gross-minded respectable persons of Shelley's time gave him the same reception which literacy and academic authority accorded to Whitman and the dear public still ignores Shelley after a hundred years. In the course of time, it became the conventional thing to read and admire Shelley, or to admire him whether one read him or not. That is, his Skylark and other nature poems were found to be admirable, just as Whitman's Captain My Captain and the Song of the Bird in Sea Drift find favor with lovers of pure lyrics and are included in chaste unrevolutionary anthologies of poetry. But Shelley's poetic rage against tyranny is so far in advance of British life today that if his ideas were put into prose, so that English people could understand them, and if they were propagated by the universities and reviews that know all about art, the government would order the troops out as promptly as it does when workmen strike for the right to live. Similarly, Whitman's essential ideas must be ignored or comfortably misunderstood by the licensed thoughtmongers, and the people must be taught that when any idea like Whitman's appeals to them as right and just and truly democratic, they are being cheated by demagogues, as Professor Santayana puts it. So much argument is necessary to account for the stupidity of learned doctors and acknowledged teachers of aesthetics in their treatment of Whitman. They are the voice of entrenched respectability against every voice of democracy. Whether Whitman becomes the poet of the people depends solely on whether the people rise from their economic and spiritual slavery and organize a true democracy. Then only will disappear the possibility that a professor of reputed authority in matters of art and philosophy can find an analogy between a mass of images without structure and the notion of an absolute democracy. Whitman's poetry is no more without structure than Shakespeare's, and an absolute democracy would be the most highly organized and well-constructed government possible. The disorder which Whitman pictures is the world as it is, his democracy is an ideal, a society of the future which is to grow out of the visible disorder of the present. Whoever then does not understand what the word democracy means, whoever does not understand that we are not living in a democracy at all, but in a timocracy, that is, under a capitalistic oligarchy, cannot understand Whitman or any other radical thinker of the nineteenth century, Ruskin, Thoreau, Wagner, Tolstoy. Whitman, who understood men and affairs shrewdly, is not under any delusion that the life about him is democratic. He chants it as a confusion and celebrates it for what it may become. The true America is for him still asleep. Why reclining 
interrogating why myself and all drowning what deepening twilight scum floating atop of the waters who are they as bats and night dogs as kent at the capital what a filthy presidentiad o south your torrid suns o north your arctic freezings are those really congressmen are those the great judges is that the president then i will sleep a while yet for i see that these states sleep for reasons with gathering murk with muttering thunder and lambent shoots we shall all duly awake south north east west inland and seaboard we will surely awake the country is not yet awake but all the countries of the world are turning in their sleep i pick up this morning's copy of a labor paper and read signs not yet understood by politicians or by professors of philosophy and economics in that paper amid the news of the day i find quotations from whitman and ruskin small signs indicating perhaps only an editor who reads good books when we wish to know what the people read it is difficult to get a census but if we are wise we do not try to find out by consulting the new york nation in his song of the broad axe whitman chants the construction of democracy not the america of mr bryce's commonwealth nor the america of the western continent but the coming world of free men where the city stands with the brawniest breed of orators and bards where the city stands that is beloved by these and loves them in return and understands them where no monuments exist to heroes but in the common words and deeds where thrifts is in its place and prudence is in its place where the men and women think lightly of the laws where the slave ceases and the master of slaves ceases where the populace rise at once against the never-ending audacity of elected persons where fierce men and women pour forth as the sea to the whistle of death pours its sweeping and unripped waves where outside authority enters always after the precedence of inside authority where the citizen is always the head and ideal and president mayor governor and what not are agents for pay where children are taught to be laws to themselves and to depend on themselves where equanimity is illustrated in affairs where speculations on the soul are encouraged where women walk in public processions in the streets the same as the men where they enter the public assembly and take the place the same as the men where the city of the faithfulest friends stands where the city of the cleanliness of the sexes stands where the city of the healthiest fathers stands where the city of the best bodied mothers stands there the great city stands this is not the city of any present land but the city of tomorrow thou mother with thy equal brood thou varied chains of different states yet one identity only a special song before i go i'd sing over all the rest for thee the future the whole of this splendid poem to a union as yet unfulfilled should take its place in collections of patriotic pieces the whole of this splendid poem to a union as yet unfulfilled should take its place in collections of patriotic pieces amid the national boasts and doggerel and the hymns that sing the warlike glories of the past the songs of a nation probably have less influence on it than poets like to believe yet it would seem that a stronger nutriment than my country tis of thee and the star-spangled banner must be provided for american children if they are ever to breed a better race than we are the race that whitman proclaims the soul its destinies the real real purport of all these apparitions of the real in thee america the soul its destinies thou globe of globes thou wonder nebulous by many a throw of heat and cold convulsed by these thyself solidifying thou mental orb thou new indeed new spiritual world the present holds thee not for such vast growth as thine for such unparalleled flight as thine such brood as thine the future only holds thee and can hold thee whatever the future holds must be made of all the elements of the present therefore whitman sings the universal world ground actuality leaves of grass is a progression a development natural seemingly spontaneous following and recording whitman's personal growth yet deliberately consciously wrought to symbolize the growth of the world the song of myself is a vast analogy representing the universe to the superficial reader a purposeless string of details it is really a song of the materials of which the poem of life is to be made out of it springs the songs of love of national unity 
that is the common brotherhood of man of cities of nature of war and its heroes lincoln the wise civilian of religion of death those who have not read whitman or have been misled by those who have not read him should open leaves of grass in the middle and come under the spell of the self-explanatory beautiful things sea drift the song of joys when lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed and then having got a liking for him should read him through to understand him entire the song of myself and children of adam are to be understood only as part of his whole development and it may be that since they stand first in leaves of grass they have forbidden some readers to go deeper into the book at the beginning of his work he is belligerently advancing a new theory of poetry the prose explanation of this theory is his backward glance over travelled roads which is as great a moment in the progress of criticism as the art of english poesy and wordsworth's prefaces to the lyrical ballads he holds that nothing if deeply understood is too ignoble for poetic expression and that the true poet will not omit the facts of life i dare not shirk any part of myself nor any part of america good or bad to enforce his doctrine that a leaf of grass is no less than the journey work of the stars he at first deliberately even aggressively selects commonplace things repulsive things the corpse with its dabbled hair the slough of boot soles what is commonest cheapest nearest easiest under stress of his conviction he seems to go out of his way to mingle together the grotesque and the magnificent the petty and the supernal later when he takes himself more for granted and has less need to drive home his theory of poetic diction and poetic content he is not so much inclined to what may seem a pell-mell catalogue like other great poets he comes to full mastery of himself and his ideas therefore his later poems are more likely than his earlier ones to capture the new reader at least let it be understood that he is not even when he sings of me walt whitman manhattanese blowing his own horn but is personating man and the universe i am the man i suffered and was there i am the hounded slave i am the mashed fireman with breastbone broken i am the old artillerist not a youngster is taken for larceny but i go up to and am tried and sentenced i tramp a perpetual journey rightly comprehended whitman's central theme is a cosmic declaration of sympathy a reverberant announcement of the love and imagination which enable the great artist to identify himself with all the joys and sorrows of man the idea has never been more mightily more embracingly expressed and its seemingly haphazard details are intended calculated by a poet in confident command of his thought and his symbols to suggest inclusion a human godlike numbering of the falling sparrow and measurement of the wide circuit of the star whitman breaks through all artificial boundaries erected by the blind hostilities of men all castes philosophies and schools that keep neighbors upon a common globe sundered from each other and from their common work he strikes the mind from a hundred sides to reach it somehow if not with one detail then with another to shock us out of our false conceits deliver us from the prison of unsympathetic isolation it is not he who is fragmentary and disparate but our thoughts and interests great-hearted people love him and understand him he is unintelligible or offensive to persons who have been deflected from him by some single verses and so have never entered him and to persons whose education has cramped their humanity or who had little humanity to begin with the new reader will find that he must read leaves of grass several times to get the full import of it the central idea is expressed in its most compact form in by blue ontario's shores and a song for occupations but leaves of grass is one poem as truly as is goethe's faust or dante's divina commedia it must be read entire or it will not be understood even by those who eagerly accept and appreciate some of the parts like an earlier lover of men whitman holds his arms about the poor and the diseased like wordsworth and burns he finds beauty in the trench digger and the breaker of stones but no one before him ever gathered the world to his bosom with such immense tenderness at thirty-five he phrased impulsively as no one else had ever phrased it that portrait of man-loving man with a few years later as hospital nurse he illustrated his own conduct in no other volume of poetry in neither dante nor shakespeare are so many motives of life so powerfully suggested blent interfused as in leaves of grass each motive each person each leaf is on a stipe 
which stands rooted in the universal ground the songs of sexual love are paeans to nature a woman's breast heaves like the sea and fatherhood emblemizes the continuous procreation of the world which wills ever to be never to cease in the elegy on lincoln the lilac and star and bird are twined in a song to death the friendships of men coil about the world and bind the races in a mystic still unrealized yet living human brotherhood comradeship flowers from the shambles of war beautiful death becomes a mode of life the primal sanities of nature are not shaken by bloody conflict the sacred moon bathes the battlefield with impartial lights as we all see it in physical nature and as whitman makes us feel it in the meaning of nature love the reconciler enfolds all world over all beautiful as the sky beautiful that war and all its deeds of carnage must in time be utterly lost that the hands of the sisters death and night incessantly softly wash again and ever again this soiled world for my enemy is dead a man divine as myself is dead i look where he lies white-faced and still in the coffin i draw near bend down and touch lightly with my lips the white face in the coffin whitman who viewed the world whole who fitted each least word knowingly in its place who celebrated the integrity of things must be read whole leaves of grass let it be repeated with whitmanian insistence is a unit an ensemble to use a favorite word of his it is not a fortuitous collection of passing moods and detached visions but a total confession of a man's poetic faith the end seen from the beginning all perfectly articulate and wrought patiently by a man who knew as absolutely as alexander pope or any other rhetorically cunning poet just what his effect should be and how to arrive at it single passages selected from whitman may be misunderstood and have been misunderstood even by readers inclined to be appreciative to take a comic example the words barbaric yawp had been quoted by themselves as if they were whitman's estimate of his poetry he had no such poor opinion of himself he thought his verse beautiful he intended to make it beautiful he was a passionate lover of exquisite sounds and sights the passage which contains the words barbaric yawp is intelligible as a whole it begins with a hawk swooping and crying over the roofs of the town whitman instantly identifies himself with the hawk and flies and cries with it as in another place he sonorously murmurously identifies himself with the surges of the sea his father his fierce old mother a more serious illustration of the ruinous effect of selecting single poems and phrases out of whitman with no sense of his vocabulary as the rest of his poetry establishes and clarifies it is the abusive quotation of parts of the children of adam whitman who sets out to praise the entire world praises along with the rest what every honest man acknowledges values delights in suffers from the procreative impulse the force which in our traditional literature few books except the bible treat plainly the force that romantic literature has perverted and comic literature has poisoned with its cynicism whitman makes us ashamed of our shame sweet sane still nakedness in nature he says in specimen days ah if poor sick prurient humanity in cities might really know you once more is not nakedness then indecent no not inherently it is your thought your fear your respectability that is indecent the world has soiled us so indelibly that we shall need a century of regeneration and many powerful voices besides whitman's to cure us of our hypocrisy and pusillanimity the civilized man to-day knows that his words on this subject will be futile and suspect and so he quotes gratefully from one of his superiors anne gilchrist a noble english woman whose delicate purity responded to the superb purity of whitman in a letter to william m rossetti the first english editor of whitman she writes you argued rightly that my confidence would not be betrayed by any of the poems in this book none of them troubled me even for a moment because i saw at a glance that it was not as men had supposed the heights brought down to the depths but the depths lifted up level with the sunlit heights that they might become clear and sunlit too always for a woman a veil woven out of her own soul never touched upon even with a rough hand by this poet but for a man a daring fearless pride in himself not a mock modesty woven out of delusions a very poor imitation of a woman's do they not see that this fearless pride 
this complete acceptance of themselves is needful for her pride her justification what is it all so ignoble so base that it will not bear the honest light of speech from lips so gifted with the divine power to use words then what hateful bitter humiliation for her to have to give herself up to the reality do you think there is ever a bride who does not taste more or less this bitterness in her cup but who put it there it must surely be man's fault not god's that she has to say to herself soul look another way you have no part in this motherhood is beautiful fatherhood is beautiful but the dawn of fatherhood and motherhood is not beautiful do they really think that god is ashamed of what he has made and appointed and if not surely it is somewhat superfluous that they should undertake to be so for him the full spread pride of man is calming and excellent to the soul of a woman above all it is true that instinct of silence i spoke of is a beautiful imperishable part of nature too but it is not beautiful when it means an ignominious shame brooding darkly shame is like a very flexible veil that follows faithfully the shape of what it covers beautiful when it hides a beautiful thing ugly when it hides an ugly one it has not covered what was beautiful here it has covered a mean distrust of a man's self and of his creator it was needed that this silence this evil spell should for once be broken and the daylight let in that the dark cloud lying under might be scattered to the winds it was needed that one who could here indicate for us the path between reality and the soul should speak that is what these beautiful despised poems the children of adam do read by the light that glows out of the rest of the volume light of a clear strong faith in god of an unfathomably deep and tender love for humanity light shed out of a soul that is possessed of itself the platonic idea of love as well expressed in some of shakespeare's sonnets or anywhere in english literature merges the love of individual in the love of immortal beauty it is a noble idea and seems at first sight not unlike whitman's sinking of the personal in the universal but the platonic idea is a thin abstraction which denatures love robs it of its human countenance in the process of eternalizing it more vitally noble is whitman's ideal which finds the body and soul of love in the bosom of living nature and glorifies the will to live the irresistible urge of creation one of the many voices by which the universe affirms that it shall not die the individual love its meeting and parting is a token of the world which is not chaos or death but form union plan it is eternal life it is happiness out of the rolling ocean the crowd came a drop gently to me whispering i love you before long i die i have travelled a long way merely to look on you to touch you for i could not die till i once looked on you for i feared i might afterward lose you now we have met now we have looked we are safe return in peace to the ocean my love i too am part of that ocean my love we are not so much separated behold the great rondure the cohesion of all how perfect but as for me for you the irresistible sea is to separate us as for an hour carrying us diverse yet cannot carry us diverse forever be not patient a little space know you i salute the air the ocean and the land every day at sundown for your dear sake my love whitman is a poet of joy of grave deep well meditated joy which breaks forth into moments of delirious ecstasy there is a kind of joy often expressed by romantic poets which is followed by a sickly reaction in the poetry of the nineteenth century it is seen sitting amid the ruins of a spurious medievalism woefully rubbing the morning head of delusion if as if browning it marches victorious to the last it pays for its continuance by falsifying life pippa's jubilant and morally efficacious song is so factitiously timed that disbelief refuses to remain suspended in a mind that sees life courageously from all sides the curative obviously cheering fact does not on most days of the world arrive on schedule like the doctor to a patient whitman is not so blind that he must justify life by denying the odious parts of it he is no timid dishonest optimist but bravely even brutally commands you to see all aspects of the conflict strange and hard the paradox true i give 
objects gross and the soul unseen are one he warbles unmitigated adoration only after he has accepted life whole sized it up and decided that the universe is not a suck and a cell representing himself as a loafer sipping delights here and there he is no butterfly of the hour but of all poets he is the one who faces death with eyes widest open serenely comprehending it and protesting plainly against the optimism that is founded on blind denial of facts the rounded catalogue divine complete sunday went this afternoon to church a college professor rev doctor gave us a fine sermon during which i caught the above words but the minister included in his rounded catalogue letter and spirit only the aesthetic things and entirely ignored what i have named in the following the devilish and the dark the dying and diseased the countless nineteen twentieths low and evil crude and savage the crazed prisoners in jail the horrible rank malignant venom and filth serpents the ravenous sharks liars the dissolute what is the part the wicked and the loathsome bear within earth's orbic scheme newts crawling things in slime and mud poisons the barren soil the evil of men the slag and hideous rot in another poem i observe the slights and degradations cast by arrogant persons upon labourers the poor and upon negroes and the like all these all the meanness and agony without end i sitting look out upon see hear and am silent so facing life he yet names its joy because joy is the force of life and the lack of it is real death spiritual death not to exclude or demarcate or pick out evils from their formidable masses even to expose them but add fuse complete extend and celebrate the immortal and the good joy shipmate joy please to my soul at death i cry our life is closed our life begins the long long anchorage we leave the ship is clear at last she leaps she swiftly courses from the shore joy shipmate joy this for him at seventy is the calming thought of all that coursing on whatever men's speculations amid the changing schools theologies philosophies amid the bawling presentations new and old the round earth's silent vital laws facts modes continue in the year that trembled and reeled beneath him must i change my triumphant songs said i to myself must i indeed learn to chant the cold dirges of the baffled and the sullen hymns of defeat and yet not you alone twilight and hurrying ebb nor you ye lost designs alone nor failures aspirations i know divine deceitful ones your glamours seeming duly by you from you the tide and light again duly the hinges turning duly the needed discord parts offsetting blending weaving from you from sleep night death itself the rhythmus of birth eternal this is his reflection on hegel roaming in thought over the universe i saw the little that is good steadily hastening towards immortality and the vast all that is called evil i saw hastening to merge itself and become lost and dead many a riotously delighted lover of life many a thoughtless hedonist in the flush of youth runs headlong against the fact of death and is daunted and from him we get the weary song of sorrow and parting and loneliness and the end but whitman in the heyday of his prime sees death and embraces him death is beautiful what indeed is finally beautiful except death and love oh i think it is not for life i am chanting here my chant of lovers i think it must be for death for how calm how solemn it grows to ascend to the atmosphere of lovers death or life i am then indifferent my soul declines to prefer i am not sure but the high soul of lovers welcomes death most give me your tone therefore o death that i may accord with it give me yourself for i see that you belong to me now above all and are folded inseparably together you love and death are nor will i allow you to balk me any more with what i was calling life for now it is conveyed to me that you are the purpose essential that you hide in these shifting forms of life for reasons and that they are mainly for you 
End of section 14. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Section 15 of the Spirit of American Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Spirit of American Literature by John Albert Macy. Section 15. Whitman. Part 2. In a great tragedy, Greek or Shakespearean, death is the solace and necessary end for sinful and unhappy lives and the close leaves the soul of the spectator in peace because bad unhappy people are better dead but life has a greater tragedy than that the death of the young and the beautiful and the innocent it is not a fitful fever upon which the blessed curtain falls but the end is inexplicable and unfitting and for that classic and romantic tragedy has no peaceful word to say but Whitman sees in death one of the consolations of life, not because it stops the tragedy of evil, tortured lives, but because impartial death does not consider whether the life has been evil or good, happy or wretched. It is part of the joy of a tragedy that is never done, and which needs no last act to give it reason, for the last act is the first, and the first the last, and both are everlasting. Come, lovely and soothing death, undulate round the world serenely arriving arriving in the day in the night to all to each sooner or later delicate death praise be the fathomless universe for life and joy and for objects and knowledge curious and for love sweet love but praise 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 for the sure and winding arms of cool and folding death dark mother always gliding near with soft feet have none chanted for thee a chant of the fullest welcome? Then I chant it for thee. I glorify thee above all. I bring thee a song that when thou must indeed come, come unfalteringly. Approach, strong deliveress. When it is so, when thou hast taken them, I joyously sing the dead. Lost in the loving floating ocean of thee, loved in the flood of thy bliss, O death, from me to thee glad serenades, dances for thee, I propose saluting thee, adornments and feastlings for thee, and the sights of the open landscape and the high-spread sky are fitting, and life and the fields and the huge and thoughtful night, the night in silence under many a star, the ocean shore and the husky whispering wave whose voice I know, and the soul turning to thee, O vast and well-veiled death, and the body gratefully nestling close to thee. Over the treetops I float thee a song, over the rising and sinking waves, over the myriad fields and the prairies wide, over the dense packed cities all and the teeming wharves and ways, I float this carol with joy, with joy to thee, O death. It is the purpose of philosophy and religion to be the ultimate reconcilers of all the facts of man's life and death. The theologies with their promise of individual beatitude, now perceptibly falling in the beliefs of men, do not so effectually rob death of its sting as does Whitman the devout pagan. He is the bravest of all poets of death. The philosophies now wavering between a half-hearted rationalism and an idealism, which is not philosophic at all, but is an admixture in philosophy of unreasoned fates, have not advanced one single argument so satisfying as Whitman's confident harmonies. The philosopher, erecting a reasonable view of life, is distinguished for his ability to leave life altogether out of his scheme, or to sew life up in a system as if it were a mummy, whereupon life takes a long breath and splits the seams. Whitman's amplitude is elastic. It bears any strain of fact, yet it is positive, re-nerving, and does not, like the vast inconclusion of most philosophy, leave you exactly where you began. Whitman's religion fuses the rigidity of creeds and is too great for creed-bound men. Oh, we can wait no longer. We too take ship, O soul. Joyous, we too launch out on trackless seas fearless for unknown shores on waves of ecstasy to sail amid the wafting winds thou pressing me to thee i thee to me o soul caroling free singing our song of god chanting our chant of pleasant exploration with laugh and many a kiss let others deprecate let others weep for sin remorse humiliation o soul thou pleasest me 
I thee. Ah, more than any priest, O soul, we to believe in God. But with the mystery of God we do not dare dally. Lover divine and perfect comrade, waiting content, invisible yet, but certain. Be thou my God, thou, thou, the ideal men, fair, able, beautiful, content, and loving, complete in body and dilate in spirit. Be thou my God. O death, for life has served its turn, opener and usher to the heavenly mansion. Be thou my God, aught, aught of mightiest, best I see, conceive or know, to break the stagnant tie, thee, thee, to free, O soul. Be thou my God, all great ideas, the race's aspirations, all heroisms, deeds of rapt enthusiasts. Be ye my gods, or time and space, or shape of earth divine and wondrous, or some fair shape I viewing worship or lustrous orb of sun or star by night be ye my gods this is a religion which jews might kiss and infidels adore whitman's own use of the word infidel means one who is unfaithful to life he reshapes traditional ethics and ignores all the vicious virtues such as tact decorum good taste humility remorse and other dishonesties and degradations of the soul life is great and will not be judged by little standards Poetry is the expression of life, grows with it and builds its own laws as it grows. Whitman himself made much of the fact that he departed from the tradition of regular meters, and, as genius is frequently mistaken about itself, he thought that his departure was essential of his originality and not the capital expression. His true originality lies in the use he made of the meters he chose, and not at all in the fact or the degree of their technical difference from other poetry. He created a new kind of poetry in so far forth as he created new poetry, and his creation is so powerful that whatever measure his words conform to at their best has become thereby established as a mode of poetry. A classic is one who makes new forms or within old forms does things before undone. That the Elizabethan translation of the Hebrew poetry of the Bible takes a shape which is at once poetic and prosaic, the translator seeking only a conscientious true prose version but various devices of Hebrew poetry, such as antithesis and refrain, inevitably showing through. This does not explain Whitman's form or even suggest its source. Equally beside, the point is the well-known fact that all great emotional prose gathers itself together tensely, drops much of the grammatical superfluity of prose, rises to a kind of lyrical passion, and its prosaic other harmony is felt like a subcurrent of movement under the higher, truly poetic pulsations. Whitman is the first great poet who from feeling, or as he would have it, from conviction and on principle, wrote unrhymed and unequal measures. When he began to make poetry, he was a desultory reader, and it is safe to say that he never heard of some of the sources that critics like to dig out in order to account for him. The difference between vers libre and more regular metrical schemes bears some analogy to the difference between music in which free melodic themes are developed to express changing and progressive moods and music on set patterns in which one stave springs from the preceding is governed and limited by it but analogies between the different arts should not be pressed too far poetry carries but a single thread of discourse the words proceed in single file whereas music may be and in its great forms is a fabric of themes fifty voices in the orchestra may be speaking at once there is, however, a sound human analogy between the ways in which Whitman and Wagner were received by some readers and listeners. Said some, Whitman is not true to any known meter of preceding poets, therefore he is no poet. Similarly argued their music-loving brethren in about the same glorious year of the world. Wagner does not obey the laws of music as the masters have practiced them, and the teachers have codified them, therefore he is no musician. The man whose education has partly paralyzed his intelligence and spoiled his eyes and ears must hold a textbook up between himself and every work of art, and so he is always puzzled by the arrival of a new genius. And since he is not necessarily an ignoramus, but may be deeply familiar with the art of preceding times, he can make out an apparently good case against the innovator. The defender of a new master may cry out in the heat of partisanship, Don't, dance. If you do not understand Wagner's beauty, you never truly understood Bach or the simplest traditional melody. If you do not know at once that Whitman is a great poet, you never truly heard, read, enjoyed Milton and Shakespeare. 
yet in point of fact some of wagner's opponents were genuine musicians and some of those whom whitman offended were true poets for example lanier musicians and poets and painters are sometimes most narrowly inhospitable to their brothers the delight they feel a lifelong joy in certain works of art is violated by innovations they are offended as if intensely loving one woman they were asked to love another woman caring deeply for art they suffer more acutely than the casual taster of art can appreciate byron did not like keats fitzgerald was blind to mrs browning emerson was deaf to poe whittier threw whitman in the fire lowell longfellow and holmes agreed that whitman was of no account swinburne first devoured whitman then disgorged him with an obscenity of expression more disgusting than anything of which walt whitman's shirt sleeve style is capable so the poets who as poe said are certainly the best critics of poetry sometimes bring the weight of their authority against each other the ordinary reader can never have the aching joy and the painful aversions which are the poet's special privileges but because he is ordinary he can gain in latitude what he lacks in depth he can carry poe in one coat pocket and whitman in the other he can share his affections between keats and byron yet he can let aurora lay and the rubaiyat stand together on a shelf of favorites since a man has not time to read much criticism he should read the prose of the poets when they are celebrating each other not when they are pushing each other off parnassus the warfare over wagner ibsen whitman need not distress us tannhauser hedda gabler and leaves of grass have survived the rough reception they encountered in some quarters and are healed of the blows that some very strong brother giants of their authors administer to them all we have to do is listen to whitman with a naked ear the better if it has been refined by other poetry in sea drift the bird which has lost its mate sings and whitman translates the notes following you my brother soothe 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 close on its wave soothes the wave behind and again another behind embracing and lapping every one close but my love soothes me not not me low hangs the moon it rose late it is lagging oh i think it is heavy with love with love oh madly the sea pushes upon the land with love with love o oh, night do i not see my love fluttering out among the breakers what is that little black thing i see there in the white loud 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 i call to you my love high and clear i shoot my voice over the waves surely you must know who is here is here you must know who i am my love low hanging moon what is that dusky spot in your brown yellow oh it is the shape the shape of my mate o oh, moon do not keep me from her any longer land land o oh, land whichever way i turn oh i think you could give me my mate back again if you only would for i am sure i see her dimly whichever way i look o oh, rising stars perhaps the one i want so much will rise will rise with some of you o oh, throat o oh, trembling throat sound clearer through the atmosphere pierce the woods of the earth somewhere listening to catch you must be the one i want shake out carols solitary here the night's carols carols of lonesome love death's carols carols under that lagging yellow waning moon oh under that moon where she droops almost down into the sea oh reckless despairing carols but soft sink low soft let me just murmur and do you wait a moment you husky noised sea for somewhere i believe i heard my mate responding to me so faint i must be still be still to listen but not altogether still for then she might not come immediately to me hither my love here i am here with this just sustained note i announce myself to you this gentle call is for you my love for you do not be decoyed elsewhere that is the whistle of the wind it is not my voice that is the fluttering the fluttering of the spray those are the shadows of leaves o oh, darkness o oh, in vain o oh, i am very sick and sorrowful o oh, brown halo in the sky near the moon dropping upon the sea o oh, troubled reflection in the sea o oh, throat o oh, throbbing heart and i sing uselessly uselessly all the night o oh, past o oh, happy life o oh, songs of joy in the air in the woods o oh, fields loved 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 but my mate no more no more with me we two together no more
if the ineffable loveliness of that is not evident at once no critical argument will avail for poetry wins its way directly or not at all however one who has studied the technique of poetry may be permitted to point out that whitman's aria is as absolutely metrical in its way as shelley's skylark and kate's nightingale are in theirs that it lacks no essential of great lyric poetry which the ear can hear of or the mind can designate if any reader is dead to its unsurpassable beauty no excuse is possible or necessary but there is no need for excuse or rebuke for those who are supposed to know something about poetry and who yet say as more than one critic has said that whitman wrote prose because he could not write poetry and that he is at his best in captain my captain where he achieves a real poetic form as if a master of words like whitman could have any trouble writing rhymes in perfect iambics if he chose to write them wagner forsooth cannot resolve a chord or write a lutheran hymn that whitman can manage traditional forms when it pleases him to try is shown not only in captain my captain but in less known and very touching poems ethiopia saluting the colours who are you dusky woman so ancient hardly human with your woolly white and turbaned head and bare bony feet while rising by the roadside here do you the colours greet tis while our army lines carolina sends and pines forth from thy loved door thou ethiopia comes to me as under doughty sherman i march towards the sea me master years a hundred years since from my parents sundered a little child they caught me as the savage beast is caught then hither me across the sea the cruel slaver brought no further does she say but lingering all the day her high-born turbaned head she wags and rolls her darkling eye and courtesies to the regiments the giddens moving by what is it faithful woman so blear hardly human why wag your head with turban bound yellow red and green are the things so strange and marvellous you see or have seen moreover captain my captain wonderful as it is is less magnificent worse than when lilacs last in the dooryard bloom with its progression and cross weaving of themes and ethiopia saluting the colours perfect itself is inferior to the majestic symbolism of the song of the banner at daybreak when whitman fails and like other great poets he sometimes fails to be his best his failure is due not to his form but to his failure to make poetry in it precisely as wordsworth and shakespeare fail in line after line of strictly methodical blank verse whitman's rhythms flow with his thought and emotion they are part of his thought the intermerging of sound and idea is the miracle that happens in all true poetry it is a fatuous mistake to say that he writes imperfect hexameters many of his lines are dactylic in rhythm other lines are iambic those two measures reside in the accents of english words the following line is a specimen of his dactylic movement when million-footed manhattan unpent descends to her pavements but this movement seldom continues for more than two or three lines at a time there is a specimen of iambic pursuit for several lines in other scenes than these have i observed the flag not quite so trim and whole and freshly blooming in folds of stainless silk but i have seen thee bunting to tatters torn upon thy splintered staff or clutch to some young colour-bearer's breast with desperate hands savagely struggle for for life or death fought over long mid cannons thunder crash and many a curse and groan and yell and rifle volleys cracking sharp and moving masses as wild demons surging and lives as nothing risked for thy mere remnant grind with dirt and smoke and sopped in blood for sake of that my beauty and that thou mightst daily is now secure there many a good man have i seen go under whitman's thought often runs to antithesis and contrast and his lines conform to the meaning in a rising and falling movement a slow pulsing systole and diastole like the resurgent and receding seas there is a fitness accidental or calculated more likely inseparable from the sound of the right words for the sense a special fitness of whitman's measures to the sea the voice of the breakers in his chants the uprushing waves and their foaming subsidence as though whitman were an elemental power resonantly answering to his equal in nature you see i resign myself to you also i guess what you mean i behold from the beach your crooked inviting fingers i behold from the beach your crooked inviting fingers i believe you refuse to go back without feeling of me we must have a turn together i undress 
hurry me out of sight of the land cushion me soft rock me in billowy drowse dash me with amorous wet i can repay you sea of stretched ground swells sea breathing loud and convulsive breaths sea of the brine of life and of unshoveled but, but always ready graves howler and scooper of storms capricious and dainty sea i am integral with you i too am of one phase and of all phases here and in the whole of sea drift has been fulfilled his aspiration had i the choice to tally greatest bards to limn their portraits stately beautiful and emulate at will homer with all his wars and warriors hector achilles ajax or shakespeare's woe entangled hamlet lear othello tennyson's fair ladies meter or wit the best or choice conceit to wield in perfect rhyme delight of singers these these o oh sea all these i'll gladly barter would you the undulation of one wave it strict to me transfer or breathe one breath of yours upon my verse and leave its odour there his verse like the sea is like the winds also and like life its eager forward propulsions are as his own vision of joy it has that energy which baudelaire called the supreme grace only because laggard criticism sometimes denies his magnificent art it is necessary to insist on its form and be curious of metrical questions one must stand back to see to comprehend him as a portrait viewed close disintegrates into ridges and smears of paint as rodin's sculpture is not for the microscope so whitman's lines can be analyzed pulverized to lifelessness they should be chanted aloud in a large free way no reader of whitman can neglect his prose for like all great poets he writes excellent prose he is an admirable direct judge of men and events of other poets intensely serious almost humorless in his poetry he is in his prose a genial offhand speaker full of fun at once burly and gentle and he is often poetically eloquent in his prose throwing off a great phrase suggesting as if casually a splendid idea the unused surplus of poetic material which lies inexhaustible in the minds of very great poets democratic vistas and specimen days are collections of observations and jottings great books as johnson's timber is a great book almost every paragraph is pregnant from his dreadfully real and beautifully patient accounts of the real war that will never get in the books to his dreamy detached musings on the sea and the stars it would be profitable for those interested in whitman but still perplexed by questions of form irrelevancies with which earnest readers of literature are needlessly filled up to the clotting and clogging of their native senses to compare whitman's own prose with his poetry and thus understand their essential differences the prose is often fine oracular full of terse metaphors and long free undulations but its accent is the accent of words spoken not sung the spread of waves and grey-white beach salt monotonous senseless such an entire absence of art books talk elegance so indescribably comforting even this winter day grim yet so delicate looking so spiritual striking emotional impalpable depths subtler than all the poems paintings music i have ever read seen heard yet let me be fair perhaps it is because i have read those poems and heard that music there is text for a whole essay about whitman in that one passage whitman was a great talker and his friends have remembered many of his words and recorded them mr horace traubel his devoted friend and biographer took down his conversations boswell fashion and in printing volume after volume of them there is a difference between mr traubel's work and boswell's a difference in mr traubel's favour whitman is a much greater more original man than dr johnson moreover boswell selected and made a work of balanced art out of the materials of his hero's life when johnson said stupid things and boswell had sense enough to know they were stupid he discreetly omitted them mr traubel goes at his task in a manner appropriate to whitman and to the new ideal of realism in biography he sets down everything that he can remember if you do not wish to read it that is your affair but it is all set down and if you do not read it you miss the richest intellect in america whitman's character requires no suppressions he bears every test of a method of publicity which is neither hero worshipful nor pitiless but simply matter of fact and indiscriminate as nature capable like all great souls of deep reticence in spite of his garrulous candor whitman moved at ease among books and men and spoke his ample mind challenging men and things less and loving them more as he grew to full stature and became the nurse of men and the celebrant of lincoln laureate and national chief of equal height 
then stricken with paralysis as a result of his labors during the war he lived to a softened benignant old age a powerful personality even when laid up on the beach fulfilling more nearly than the man who phrased it the ideal of a poet who makes his life a poem biographical note walter whitman was born on long island new york may thirty first eighteen hundred and nineteen and died at camden new jersey march twenty fifth eighteen hundred and ninety two he had no education beyond the primary schools he spent his youth reading observing loafing he was for a time a school teacher a compositor and an editor he edited the brooklyn eagle in eighteen hundred and seventy four to eighteen hundred and seventy eight the next year he tramped over the country west to the great lakes south to new orleans supporting himself by freelance contributions to newspapers in eighteen hundred and fifty one to eighteen hundred and fifty two he owned and edited a newspaper in brooklyn he spent some time as carpenter and builder during the war he wrote for the newspapers and was volunteer nurse in the hospitals at washington he was clerk in several departments of the government at washington from eighteen hundred and sixty five to eighteen hundred and seventy four when he was stricken with partial paralysis he lived the rest of his life at camden new jersey his poetry meant a practical as well as an intellectual fight it involved him in trouble with one chaste official at washington on whom he depended for his clerkship but his friends got him a place in another department in boston his publishers osgood and company were legally compelled to withdraw his book from circulation because he refused to consent to the omission of passages indicated by the district attorney the meddlers who made complaint were the vicious society for the suppression of vice the boston postmaster who excluded the book from the mail was directed from washington to admit it the result of official interference was to advertise whitman's poetry and make official dumb look so foolish as he always believed it to be long before he personally felt its impertinence and the never-ending audacity of elected persons the last years of his life were peaceful and were made happy by appreciation his works are leaves of grass eighteen hundred and fifty five eighteen hundred and fifty six eighteen hundred and sixty eighteen hundred and sixty seven eighteen hundred and seventy one eighteen hundred and eighty two eighteen hundred and eighty three drum taps eighteen hundred and sixty five passage to india eighteen hundred and seventy democratic vistas eighteen hundred and seventy one memoranda during the war eighteen hundred and seventy five specimen days eighteen hundred and eighty two november bows eighteen hundred and eighty eight goodbye my fancy eighteen hundred and ninety one autobiographia etc eighteen hundred and ninety two recent editions of leaves of grass include all his poetry for he added his later verse to it as annexes the best life of whitman consists of his own autobiographia or the story of a life specimen days etc and his conversations with walt whitman and camden edited by his executor horace traubel the life by richard maurice buck is authentic a good study is that by the english writer h b binns stevenson's essay in familiar studies of men and books wavers between hearty praise and a fear that he and whitman will be misunderstood so that its effect is inconclusive the essay by professor george santayana in poetry and religion is a perfect justification of whitman's dislike of aesthetics the essay by anne gilchrist found in her life and writings quoted from above is excellent j a simmons walt whitman a study is sympathetic john burroughs whitman a study is the work of a friend and a wise man william d o'connor's the good gray poet is a fiery piece of eloquence in defense of whitman still good reading but unnecessarily hot to a generation which does not question whitman's greatness swinburne's attack published in the fortnightly review august eighteen hundred and eighty seven should be read by all interested in either whitman or swinburne one of the best books is days with walt whitman by the english poet and philosopher edward carpenter many opinions of whitman are collected in in re walt whitman edited by the literary executors traubel buck and Harned. end of section fifteen read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama section sixteen of the spirit of american literature this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read for you by chiquito crasto the spirit of american literature by john albert macy chapter thirteen mark twain part one gulliver's travels is to be found in two editions 
one for adult minds, the other for adventurous immaturity. The texts differ but little, if at all. Differences are mainly differences in the reader. For one audience, Gulliver's Travels is a story book like Robinson Crusoe and Treasure Island. For the other audience, it is a tremendous satire on human nature, a vast portrait of man, the nakedly simple narrative uttering profundities before which the sentimental quail and hypocrites wear an unhappy smile. The boy who follows the strange fortunes of Dr. Gulliver does not know that Swift is talking over his head to the parents who gave the boy the wonder book. All satire is dual in nature. It speaks in parable, saying one thing and meaning a deep parallelism. It is a preacher in cap and bells. To the holiday mood of the world and the wholesomely childish popular mind, Mark Twain's books like Gulliver's Travels appeal instantly. For forty years he has been a favorite comedian, a beloved jester, picturesque, histrionic in all his public attitudes. His books have been sold by hundreds of thousands. Of Joan of Arc, one of his least popular books, I wrote it for love, he says, and never expected it to sell. Sixteen thousand copies were sold in the years from 1904 to 1908. Mark Twain was the most successful man of letters of his time in the duration and variety of his powers, in the number and enthusiasm of his audience, he had no rival in English literature after Dickens. To say in the face of that towering popularity that he is greater than his reputation may seem praise beyond reason, and it may be presumptuous to suggest that the millions who admire him do not at all know how great a man they admire or what in him is most admirable. Nevertheless, it is true that this incorrigible and prolific joker has kept the world chuckling so continuously that it has not sobered down to comprehend what a powerful original thinker he is. If you mention his name, someone says, Oh, yes, do you remember what he said when it was reported that he was dead? You smile appreciatively and insist, Yes, but have you read Joan of Arc? Have you really read, since you grew up, the greatest piece of American fiction, Huckleberry Finn? The response is apt to be more willing than intelligent. Some men of letters, like Mr. Bernard Shaw, and some critics, such as Professor W. L. Phelps and Professor Brander Matthews, have measured his significance. Mr. Howells, after warning us not to forget the joker in the gravity of our admiration, said it all in a few words. Clemens, the sole and incomparable, the Lincoln of our literature. Other critics remain truer to the critic type, by condescending to contemporary greatness and reserving highest praise for Mark Twain's equals who lived long ago, Swift, Moliere, Cervantes, Fielding. As an example of the timid ineptitude of critics in the presence of living greatness, I quote from a handbook of American literature published five or six years ago. In it, a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's coat is called a cruel parody of Mallory's Mort d'Atour. It is not cruel, and it is not a parody. In other respects, the criticism is profoundly true. It is unfortunate, says the same handbook, it is unfortunate for Mr. Clemens that he is a humorist. No one can ever take such a man seriously. It is unfortunate, just as it is a burning shame, that Lamb was not an epic poet, and that Swift was not a church historian. To take humorists seriously is superficially incongruous. We should approach all satirists from Aristophanes to George Meredith in a spirit of gay delight. If we talk too solemnly about them, their spirits will wink us out of countenance. However, it is a well-established custom to discuss masters of humor who have been dead a long time, as if they were really important in the history of human thought, and without a too ponderous solemnity, one may seriously praise and expound the wisdom of the great laugh-maker who died two years ago. Mark Twain began as a newspaper reporter, a funny column man. He was a natural storyteller. His delightful flexible voice was a melancholy vehicle for outrageous absurdities, and the mask of a grieved and puzzled countenance was a gift of the gods to a platform humorist. His natural talents of mind and manner make him successful on the Pacific coast before he thought of himself as a professional man of letters. As he grew older, he cultivated the gifts which he had discovered by accident, came in time to a perfect and conscious command of his art, 
and by much reading and writing and experience made himself a very great master of prose his first book of sketches printed in eighteen hundred and sixty seven is of no better quality than the work of hundreds of newspaper men who put a little fun into their day's scribbling and so get a little fun out of it the sketches had given clemens a local reputation before they were printed as a book and prompted the proprietors of alta california to send him on the famous voyage of the steamer quaker city the report of that voyage is innocence abroad a first-rate book of travel which revealed at once an accomplished writer of sincere vigorous english as if the spirit of incongruities had conspired to make fun doubly funny innocence abroad has been regarded by those who read with any part of their organism except their intellect as an expression of american irreverence grinning at the august beauties of europe so far as it is disrespectful its satire is aimed at the dishonest american tourist at the gaping pretender who feigns to see beauty where it is not or where he does not see it and misses beauty where it is upon the pilgrims with their fraudulent enthusiasms their vandal thefts of souvenirs from places that they call sacred the clerk of the party pours his scornful ridicule to swindlers who exploit art and antiquity for the sake of the tourist dollar he gives no quarter romances that thoughtless people accept as lovely but which are essentially base like the story of abelard he tears to shreds the unshakable realist here begins to deal those blows to sentimentality and pretensions which ring through all his work to the last disingenuous books of travel he writes in a heap sets fire to them and dances round the pyre nearly every book concerning galilee and its lake describes the scenery as beautiful no not always so straightforward as that sometimes the impression intentionally conveyed is that it is beautiful at the same time that the author is careful not to say that it is in plain saxon but a careful analysis of these descriptions will show that the materials of which they are formed are not individually beautiful and cannot be wrought into combinations that are beautiful the veneration and the affection which some of these men felt for the scenes they were speaking of heated their fancies and biased their judgment but the pleasant falsities they wrote were full of honest sincerity at any rate others wrote as they did because they feared it would be unpopular to write otherwise others were hypocrites and deliberately meant to deceive any of them would say in a moment if asked that it is always right and always best to tell the truth they would say that at any rate if they did not perceive the drift of the question but why should not the truth be spoken of this region is the truth harmful has it ever needed to hide its face god made the sea of galilee and its surroundings as they are it is the province of mr grimes to improve upon the work i am sure from the tenor of the books i have read that many who have visited this land in years gone by were presbyterians and came seeking evidences in support of their particular creed they found a presbyterian palestine and they had already made up their minds to find no other though possibly they did not know it being blinded by their zeal others were baptists seeking baptist evidences in a baptist palestine others were catholics methodists episcopalians seeking evidences endorsing their creeds and a catholic a methodist and episcopalian palestine honest as these men's intentions may have been they were full of partialities and prejudices they entered the country with their verdicts already prepared and they could no more write dispassionately and impartially about it than they could about their own wives and children our pilgrims have brought their verdicts with them they have shown it in their conversation ever since we left beirut i can almost tell in set phrase what they will say when they see tabor nazareth jericho and jerusalem because i have the books they will smouch their ideas from these authors write pictures and frame rhapsodies and lesser men follow and see with the author's eyes instead of their own and speak with his tongue the passage expresses mark twain's lifelong attitude towards books and men he looked on the world with a serious candid and penetrating eye analyzing the human fool affectionately tolerant of his folly except when it is mixed with meanness and cruelty in a letter he wrote shortly before his death he said referring to his book on shakespeare 
in that booklet i courteously hinted at the long ago well-established fact that even the most gifted human being is merely an ass and always an ass when his forebears have furnished him an idol to worship reasoning cannot convert him facts cannot influence him i wrote the booklet for pleasure not in the expectation of convincing anybody that shakespeare did not write shakespeare and don't you write with any such expectation such labors are not worth the ink and the paper except when you do them for the pleasure of it shakespeare the stratford tradesman will still be the divine shakespeare to our posterity a thousand years hence in innocence abroad the self-deceptions and pious bunkum of the pilgrims the mendacious guides the tall traditional stories told for money to tourists by vergers and ciceroni stories besides which american exaggeration is shrinking understatement all these impositions move the recording innocent to cut capers to play the vacant idiot and then to pour out one of his level streams of deadly accurate and demolishing irony it is a pleasure to read him in his abusive moods and it was a greater pleasure to hear him in one of his coolly passionate tirades speaking sentences amazingly finished and constructed as if a prose style were as natural to him as breathing in a voice even deliberate modulated and sweet with rage besides much excellent fooling and vigorous destruction of what is revered but not reverend there is in innocence abroad a good deal of fine clear description of things seen indeed the book is on the whole a serious report of sights and events the characterization of the pilgrims reveals the gift that was later to draw shrewd portraits of human beings real and fictitious mark twain shows in this book as in much of his writing the deep enthusiasm for natural beauty which is impossible to people who can harbor dishonest admirations the description of vesuvius is powerful graphic as fresh as if no other man had seen and described it clement's next book roughing it is merely a personal narrative describing the rise growth and culmination of the silver mining fervor in nevada it appeared at the time when bret harte was capturing the fancy of unsophisticated readers with his delightful disingenuous tales of the wild west o henry in some respects a better story-teller than bret harte has said that the editors of new york magazines and their eastern readers are so naively ignorant that in a cowboy yarn the author can stab a man with a lariat and they will not know the difference to this romantic ignorance bret harte appealed with pictures of a theatric california and portraits of miners such as never dug in the real earth his tales are skilfully written humorous quasi pathetic and engagingly readable but they are made for export to people who do not know the flavor of better native wines in his book is shakespeare dead mark twain says i know the argo of the quartz mining and milling industry familiarly and so whenever bret harte introduces that industry into a story the first time one of his miners opens his mouth i recognize from his phrasing that harte got the phrasing by listening like shakespeare i mean the stratford one not by experience no one can talk the quartz dialect correctly without learning it with pick and shovel and drill and fuse Hart's unreality is deeper than that. He is a sentimentalist who makes untrustworthy assays of men and society. He mistakes the iron pyrites of melodrama and farce for the gold-bearing quartz of human nature. This is not to deny Bret Hart's merits, which are genuine, if not of a high order. He is not exceptional in his attitude toward life and toward fiction. Too many American storytellers of considerable literary skill are thinly romantic they move in regions of artificial adventure and moonlit emotion only in the last quarter of the nineteenth century did the spirit of realism find itself at home among a people reputed to be sensible and practical but really sentimental and foolish and content with a conduct of private and public affairs that fills an intelligent businessman with despair their thinking is childish and they swallow with delight any silly story whether it is presented as a work of fiction or a fact of history and government the first strong voice of realism in the western part of america is mark twain and roughing it is its first expression a statement that some americans would probably meet by pointing out that mark twain changes the names of nevada people and invents things that really did not happen 
imagination is wasted on a people who hug mark twain's jokes as a child hugs a jumping jack and do not know that roughing it is an important social study reconstructing in its own unmethodical fashion a phase of american history a section of the national life under the touch of a great instinctive humorist whose vision is sharp and undiluted whose lively caricature plays over a cold sense of fact the silver boom town its comedy and tragedy takes permanent and accurate shape for the benefit of an inquisitive posterity that will wish to study our social history in the gilded age mark twain and charles dudley warner worked together two claims only one of which shows a real metal the story is of two sets of characters brought together in a forced and unconvincing unity the young people from the east with their commonplace love affairs figure in one plot which crosses the fortunes and misfortunes of colonel sellers and his family everything in the book except colonel sellers may be sacrificed without great loss to literature sellers is a colossal comic creation the embodied spirit of western mushroom hopes and bubble enterprise the type is so true to human nature and especially to american human nature in a land of rapid haphazard exploitation sudden wealth and disastrous progress that the authors were besieged with claimants for the honor of having sat as model there was a real person a kinsman of clemens who suggested the character but there was no model except perennial humanity the book as a whole is amateurish and lacking in cohesion one suspects that colonel sellers kept the two humorists gaily interested in the work and that they made up the rest of the book in a perfunctory way at a low pitch of creative enthusiasm some years later in the american claimant mark twain brought colonel sellers on the stage again in this book as in the gilded age the story is nothing unless it is a cruel parody of little lord fauntleroy but sellers is himself generous and pathetically lovable for all his sham wisdom and magniloquent inflation he is like don quixote and some of dickens's characters drawn taller than life-size but he is true to the outlines of humanity a pantographic enlargement of man the delight with which the public received colonel sellers encouraged clemens to try another work of fiction he wrote one of the best of boys books tom sawyer the adventure in the cave and the finding of gold are the good old-fashioned stuff of dime novels mark twain like that other wise man with the heart of a boy stevenson has taken the traditional boy romance and made it literature except for its one affluent adventure in treasure trove the book is all actual boy life a masterly biography of the universal youngster the adult novel in america is not yet adult but four men of letters aldrich warner mr howells and mark twain have limbed us immortally as we all were in the golden age it may be that tom sawyer and huckleberry finn aldrich's story of a bad boy and howells flight of pony baker and warner's being a boy are the reaction of humor and naturalism against the era of saint rollo like all true books about boys tom sawyer gives glimpses of the social conditions and habits of the older generation there are wider glimpses in huckleberry finn indeed this is more than a boy's book or a book about boys it is a study of many kinds of society seen through eyes at once innocent and prematurely sage those who are fond of classifying books may see in huckleberry finn a new specimen of the picaresque novel of adventure some classifiers going back further for analogies have called it the odyssey of the mississippi which is strikingly inept it is a piece of modern realism original deep and broad and it is in american literature deplorably solitary it is one of the unaccountable triumphs of creative power that seem to happen now and again as robinson crusoe happened and the surrounding intellectual territory has not its comrade huck's dialect is a marvel of artistry as clemens says in a significant preface the shadings in the dialects reported by huck have not been done in a haphazard fashion or by guesswork but painstakingly and with the trustworthy guidance and support of personal familiarity with these several forms of speech to maintain huck's idiom and through it to describe a storm on the mississippi with intense vividness through the same dialect to narrate the tragic feud between the granger fords and the shepherdsons to hint profound social facts through the mouth of a boy and not violate his point of view this is a work of a very great imagination huck's reflection on tom sawyer's proposal 
to steal a nigger out of slavery is a more dramatic revelation of the slaveholder's state of mind than uncle tom's cabin and expresses more powerfully than a thousand treatises the fact that morality is based on economic and social conditions well one thing was dead sure and that was that tom sawyer was in earnest and was actually going to help to steal that nigger out of slavery that was a thing that was too many for me here was a boy that was respectable and well brung up and had a character to lose and folks at home that had characters and he was bright and not leather-headed and knowing and not ignorant and not mean but kind and yet here he was without any more pride or rightness or feeling than to stoop to this business and make himself a shame before everybody colonel sherburn's speech to the crowd that came to lynch him is a sermon on cowardice and valor delivered to the american bully it is mark twain uttering one of his favorite ideas through the colonel perhaps huck would have not reported the colonel's words so accurately they swarmed up in front of sherburn's palings as thick as they could jam together and you couldn't hear yourself think for the noise it was a little twenty-foot yard some sung out tear down the fence tear down the fence then there was a racket of ripping and tearing and smashing and down she goes and the front wall of the crowd begins to roll in like a wave just then sherburn steps out onto the roof of his little front porch with a double-barreled gun in his hand and takes his stand perfectly calm and deliberate not saying a word the racket stopped and the wave sucked back sherburn never said a word just stood there looking down the stillness was awful creepy and uncomfortable sherburn run his eye slow along the crowd and wherever it struck the people tried to outgaze him but they wouldn't they dropped their eyes and looked sneaky then pretty soon sherburn sort of laughed not the pleasant kind but the kind that makes you feel like when you are eating bread that's got sand in it then he says slow and scornful the idea of you lynching anybody it's amusing the idea of you thinking you had pluck enough to lynch a man because you're brave enough to tar and feather poor friendless cast-out women that come along here did that make you think you had grit enough to lay your hands on a man why a man's safe in the hands of ten thousand of your kind as long as it's daytime and you're not behind him do i know you i know you clear through i was born and raised in the south and i've lived in the north so i know the average all around the average man's a coward in the north he lets anybody walk over him that wants to and goes home and prays for a humble spirit to bear it in the south one man all by himself has stopped a stage full of men in the daytime and robbed the lot your newspapers call you a brave people so much that you think you are braver than any other people whereas you're just as brave and no braver why don't your juries hang murderers because they're afraid the man's friends will shoot them in the back in the dark and it's just what they would do so they always acquit and then a man goes in the night with a hundred masked cowards at his back and lynches the rascal your mistake is that you didn't bring a man with you that's one mistake and the other is that you didn't come in the dark and fetch your masks you brought part of a man buck harkness there and if you hadn't had him to start you'd have taken it out in blowing you didn't want to come the average man don't like trouble and danger you don't like trouble and danger but if only half a man like buck harkness there shouts lynch him lynch him you're afraid to back down afraid you'll be found out to be what you are cowards and so you raise a yell and hang yourselves on to that half a man's coat tail and come raging up here swearing what big things you're going to do the pitifulest thing out is a mob that's what an army is a mob they don't fight with courage that's born in them but with courage that's borrowed from their mass and from their officers but a mob without any man at the head of it is beneath pitifulness now the thing for you to do is droop your tails and go home and crawl in a hole if any real lynching's going to be done it will be done in the dark southern fashion and when they come they'll bring their masks and fetch a man along now leave and take your half a man with you tossing his gun up across his left arm and cocking it when he says this the crowd washed back sudden and then broke all apart and went tearing off every which way and buck harkness he healed it after them looking tolerable cheap i could a stayed if i wanted to but i didn't want to 
End of section 16. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Section 17 of the Spirit of American Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Spirit of American Literature by John Albert Macy. Chapter 13. Mark Twain. Part 2. The Prince and the Pauper, which, like Huckleberry Finn, is read with delight by children, is a parable in democracy. Lazarus and Dives in the figures of two pretty boys change places, and for once the mighty learn by experience how the other half lives. The same idea is dramatized in a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Coat, where the king incognito goes out among the people. Mark Twain hated the lords of the earth. In the Tsar's soliloquy, his hatred is at a white heat. In the course of one of those enchanting monologues with which he entertained his guests, he said that every Russian child should drink in with his mother's milk the resolution to kill a Tsar, until every Romanov would rather sit on a stool in his backyard than on a throne of crime. He laughed also at the hypocrisy of false republicanism and proved that every Democrat loves a lord and why. Humanity, ridiculous, pathetic and pretentious, is all divided into castes, each caste merciless and snobbish. Its portrait is drawn in this passage from a Connecticut Yankee. Toward the shaven monk who trudged along with his cowl tilted back and the sweat washing his fat jowls, the coal burner was deeply reverent. To the gentleman he was abject. With a small farmer and the free mechanic he was cordial and gossipy. And when a slave passed by with a countenance respectfully lowered, this chap's nose was in the air. He couldn't even see him. Well, there are times when one would like to hang the whole human race and finish the farce that is written not about a mythical england of the dark ages but about us the book is a satire on society two conditions of uncivilization are thrown into grotesque contrast primarily for the fun of it all and also for the sake of flaying priesthood and kingship the book is not a parody of mort d'arteur and it is not cruel mark twain would not have been so witless as to parody a harmless old book he is not interested in mallory but in man, and especially in the conflict between man's intelligence and his superstitions. It is, however, worth noting that like all wise men who chance to give their opinions about books, Mark Twain is a good critic. He touches unerringly on Mallory's weaknesses, his lack of humor, and his inability to characterize. In Mallory, Sir Dinadan is represented as having delivered a convulsed ballad, but Mallory cannot give the ballad or furnish his humorist with anything to say. Mark Twain seizes this chance to make Sir Dinadan the court bore. Sandy tells the Yankee a story which is taken from Mallory, and the Yankee makes a comment which is a just and compact criticism of that inchoate bundle of legends. When you come to figure up results, you can't tell one fight from another, nor who whipped, and as a picture of living, raging, roaring battle, show why it's pale and noiseless, just ghosts scuffling in a fog. Tear me. What would this barren vocabulary get out of the mightiest spectacle? The burning of Rome in Nero's time, for instance. Why, it would merely say, town burned down, no insurance, boy brast a window, fireman break his neck. Why, that ain't a picture. Clemens was a shrewd critic of books because he was a shrewd critic of men. He was not hypnotized by what other people thought of the good and the great. He thought for himself. The essays on Cooper and Shelley and Mr. Howells are better than most of the work of professional critics. Some of his casual remarks about books and authors are memorable. He disliked The Vicar of Wakefield, because the misadventure of Moses at the fair is represented as funny, whereas it is a pathetic and touching thing when a boy is deceived. Clemens had no admiration for Jane Austen, and used to argue with Mr. Howells, who adores her. Most people will agree with Mr. Howells but nobody can forget, once he had heard it, Mark Twain's way of putting his disapproval. A very good library can be started by leaving Jane Austen out. A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's coat has obvious kinship to Don Quixote. Both books satirize the ideals of a spurious chivalry. Don Quixote, an idealist, tilts with facts and is beaten, 
until finally his mind is freed from the dark clouds of ignorance with which the continual reading of those detestable books of chivalry had obscured it the yankee the incarnation of facts tilts with childish idealism and religious credulity and is beaten it has been often said that don quixote gave the death blow to chivalry a statement which carelessly overlooks the fact that chivalry never existed the state of society of which it is the legendary picture has passed before cervantes and if by chivalry is meant the literary ideal that ideal cervantes did not kill for it survived lustily to the nineteenth century the knight of la mancha was product of a library of romance which was never read by greater numbers of people than in the past hundred years it may be that cervantes ought to have laughed amadis de gaulle and all his generation off the stage then we should have been spared those poor modern imitations of a genuine old literature those legends of paper kings and tinsel knights which tennyson and other men of our world having no real feeling for them except in a half-hearted anachronistic way could not make convincing that tennyson should have devoted a lifetime to a masterpiece of such flimsy stuff as the idols of the king which are not of the spirit of the age and therefore not vital and that people should take seriously as a kingly ideal his insufferable prig of a hero show that unfortunately cervantes did not succeed in clarifying the english mind whatever medicinal effect he may have had on the spanish wagner used legends akin to the arthurian for operatic purposes and in his ring he turned the stories into parables on modern society one english poet swinburne tried to make the arthurian story truly tragic by adding to it or imputing to it a greek faith motive of which the old legends are quite innocent in the hands of most other modern poets the ideals of chivalry not being native and intensely felt but merely admired through a misty literary haze are both confused and feeble a connecticut yankee is a humorous jest not at any true ancient manner of thought or any class of fairy tale but at the falsification of history and at idiotic moonshine held up to admiration as serious story and clothed in the grave beauty of poetry not that mark twain was a conscious critic of nineteenth-century imitation romance but like all realists he was filled with the spirit of his time and quite without intention of making romantic poets and other sentimentalists uncomfortable he sends the world of terrific and really interesting facts crashing into the stage world of false moonlight and tin armor the knights of legend as their modern poetic champions portray them are garrulous boobies and bullies their chivalric attitude towards women is a fraud that disgusts a truly chivalrous man the sentimentalist who admires arthur as perfectly lovely and who thinks it philistine to laugh at him will never understand of course that tennyson's ideals are commonplace and the laureate himself a tedious philistine nor will they ever understand the great realists moliere fielding cervantes mark twain true chivalry is possible only in those who detest false chivalry mark twain was a supremely chivalrous man a man of exquisite courtesy and of beautiful loyalty to all ancient and contemporary idealisms i have read somewhere the opinion that he was vulgar but the unique cannot be vulgar moreover as puddenhead wilson says there are no people who are quite so vulgar as the over-refined clemens has also been called irreverent he was disrespectful of all superstitions including his own says puddenhead wilson let me make the superstitions of a nation and i care not who makes its laws or its songs either mark twain was a globe-trotter he knew all grades and conditions of man and he was a reader of history and biography he was early cured of the grossest of superstitions abject patriotism with which all peoples are drenched and with which americans especially seem to be afflicted you see my kind of loyalty says the yankee was a loyalty to one's country not to its institutions or its office holders the country is the real thing the substantial thing the eternal thing it is the thing to watch over and care for and be loyal to institutions are extraneous they are its mere clothing and clothing can wear out because ragged cease to be comfortable cease to protect the body from winter disease and death to be loyal to rags to shout for rags to worship rags to die for rags that is a loyalty of unreason it is pure animal it belongs to monarchy was invented by monarchy let monarchy keep it i was from connecticut 
whose constitution declares that all political power is inherent in the people and all free governments are founded on their authority and instituted for their benefit and that they have at all times an undeniable and indefeasible right to alter their form of government in such a manner as they may think expedient under that gospel the citizen who thinks he sees that the commonwealth's political clothes are worn out and yet holds his peace and does not agitate for a new suit is disloyal he is a traitor that he may be the only one who thinks he sees this decay does not excuse him it is his duty to agitate anyway and it is the duty of the others who vote him down if they do not see the matter as he does that is the mark twain who jokingly said that the only distinct native criminal class in america is congressmen the mark twain who despairingly predicted that america having proved that it was not capable of being truly democratic would probably set up a monarchy in the course of another century and who uttered as blasting an arraignment of american plutocracy as ever fell from a man's lips americans complacent and sentimental do not yet know the power of mark twain's swiftian attack on our flimsy-minded patriotism and religiosity after his death he was slandered by nice critics who purvey optimism and water to the multitude they spoke of his kindly wit and humor which never hurt any one from such libel may he be defended some missionaries politicians soldiers and priests of several churches from rome to huntington avenue boston will if they have read his works tell a different story only a man whose heart is purged of counterfeit idealism can be the lofty idealist that mark twain was he worshipped truth and worthy individuals dead and living his personal recollections of joan of arc is a tribute to a heroine whose nobility is authentic whose good head and good heart are proved by documents it is an eloquent book indistinct with such reverence and passion for beauty as are possible in a soul that is not moved by hazy pieties or tricked by too easy credulity the tone of the book is sustainedly perfect the style excellently managed by the same imagination that holds unbrokenly true the character and diction of huckleberry finn after he acknowledged the book everybody saw that he must have written it and pointed to the obvious mark twainisms but when the story was first published anonymously many wise critics failed to guess the authorship in one character mark twain is enjoying himself in his everyday manner in the paladin the comic foil the picturesque liar whom mark twain likes to introduce into all human company the episode in the fifteenth chapter of the second book laughter in the lap of tragedy is one of those wrenching contrasts of human feelings such as only the shakespeare's can draw unfalteringly in the work of no modern prose writer is there wider range than in the work of mark twain from huckleberry finn to joan of arc he had wonderful breadth of knowledge and interest whatever he encountered he possessed and he seems to have turned almost every experience into a written page when at the end of his life he came to write what was to be the best and truest autobiography ever written he confessed in whimsical desperation that he could not tell the truth and never had told the truth that as puddenhead wilson says the very ink with which history is written is prejudice he must also have found that he had already written in his other books as much of his autobiography as it was possible for him to write his books are a record of his career from his memories of boyhood to his last travels around the world he wrote three more books of the desultory type of innocent abroads and roughing it namely a tramp abroad life on the mississippi and following the equator his sketches of travel are first-rate examples of that informal sort of tourist essay to which in their way belong thackeray's cornhill to cairo and kinglake's eothen of travel books there are many of vital ones there are all too few those few are made by great original talkers who find something more or less apropos to say in any scene they chance to visit life on the mississippi is a record in the king's english of the country and types of life made even more surely immortal in the dialect of huckleberry finn puddenhead wilson a fantastic tale is laid on the lower mississippi before the war like mark twain's other attempts to write a novel in conventional form puddenhead wilson is not well constructed it succeeds by virtue of one comic character whose calendar became the vehicle of mark twain's epigrams as he confesses in the introduction to those extraordinary twins he is not a born novelist his account of his difficulty in managing a story will make any one chuckle who has ever tried to write fiction 
the book was finished she rowena was sidetracked and there was no possibility of crowding her in anywhere i could not leave her there of course it would not do after spreading her out so and making such a to-do over her affairs it would be absolutely necessary to account to the reader for her i thought and thought and studied and studied but i arrived at nothing i finally saw plainly that there was really no way but one i must simply give her the grand bounce it grieved me to do it for after associating with her so much i had come to kind of like her after a fashion notwithstanding she was such an ass and said such stupid irritating things and was so nauseatingly sentimental still it had to be done so at the top of chapter seventeen i put a calendar remark concerning july the fourth and began the chapter with this statistic rowena went out in the back yard after supper to see the fireworks and fell down the well and got drowned it seemed abrupt but i thought that maybe the reader wouldn't notice it because i changed the subject right away to something else anyway it loosened rowena up from where she was stuck and got her out of the way and that was the main thing it seemed a prompt good way of weeding out people that had got stalled and a plenty good enough way for those others so i hunted up the two boys and said they went out back one night to stone the cat and fell down the well and got drowned next i searched around and found old aunt patsy cooper and aunt betsy hale when they were aground and said they went out back one night to visit the sick and fell down the well and got drowned i was going to drown some of the others but i gave up the idea partly because i believed that if i kept that up it would arouse attention and perhaps sympathy with those people and partly because it was not a large well and would not hold any more anyway among clemens's miscellanies are several little masterpieces the man that corrupted hadleyburg eve's diary and captain stormfield's visit to heaven the man that corrupted hadleyburg condenses human avarice and human mendacity into a fable that says where you are numbered and leaves you laughing and morally naked hadleyburg is a town lying on the east bank of the mississippi river it extends eastward to the west bank of the river eve's diary is a beautiful piece of poetic prose it is a joke of course the absent-minded brontosaurus is there to prove it and the respectable american librarians and library trustees who owing to their lack of historical knowledge objected to eve's costume and ruled the book off the shelves made the joke a perfect torture of hilarity nevertheless it is poetry eve's effort to gather the stars in a basket is such a conception as only genius is blessed with the comedy of the sketch appeals immediately to that national calamity american humor which never was on earth until after the voyages of columbus many americans no doubt curl up in convulsed delight at the excruciating fun of the passage which closes the book but a civilized man will appreciate its tender beauty forty years later it is my prayer it is my longing that we may pass from this life together a longing which shall never perish from the earth but shall have place in the heart of every wife that loves until the end of time and it shall be called by my name but if one of us must go first it is my prayer that it shall be i for he is strong and i am weak i am not so necessary to him as he is to me life without him would not be life how could i endure it this prayer is also immortal and will not cease from being offered up while my race continues i am the first wife and in the last wife i shall be repeated at eve's grave adam wheresoever she was there was eden captain stormfield's visit to heaven completes the work which satire science and intellectual honesty have been engaged in for over a century it makes ultimate nonsense of the sentimentalist heaven mark twain's mind was of universal proportions he meditated on all the deep problems and somewhere in his work he touches upon most of the vital things that men commonly think about and wonder about as he once quaintly said i am the only man living who understands human nature god has put me in charge of this branch office when i retire there will be no one to take my place i shall keep on doing my duty for when i get over on the other side i shall use my influence to have the human race drowned again and this time drowned good no omissions no arc his was the veracity of an accurately controlled extravagance a destroyer of false idols he was an idolater of beauty especially of beautiful women he was a man of exquisite dignity very sensitive and fine 
and yet capable at seventy of fooling like a boy the final philosophy of this lover of boys and men and women and cats is as he says a desolating doctrine that is it is desolating to timidity but very brave for those who can square their shoulders and look things straight in the eye it teaches that we have an interior master whom our conduct must satisfy and whom nothing but good conduct will leave in peace it eliminates all extraneous bribes to be good it is like the religion which is preached in a work by another austere moralist in mr bernard shaw's the showing up of blanco posnet and it bears some resemblance to the human scepticism of mr thomas hardy without studying or caring at all for official philosophy and all the wiser for the omission mark twain came to a position of ethical and materialistic determinism which is rife in the thought of our time and is in one aspect as old as the greek who said character is fate for his philosophy most readers quite properly care nothing they care for his portrait of mankind and that is the greatest canvas that any american has painted biographical note samuel langhorne clements was born in florida missouri november thirtieth eighteen hundred and thirty five he died in reading connecticut april twenty first nineteen hundred and ten he never went to school after his father died in eighteen hundred and forty seven when he was eighteen years old he wandered east for a year supporting himself by setting type in eighteen hundred and fifty seven he became a pilot on the mississippi the war put an end to that occupation his brother was appointed by lincoln first secretary of the new territory of nevada and clemens accompanied him as private secretary without pay he hunted for fortune in the mines as he narrates in roughing it and found fortune in his pen in the offices of local newspapers a quarrel with a rival editor resulted in a duel nobody hurt and clemens was obliged to leave the state he went to san francisco and worked in the newspapers there for one of them he made the voyage to honolulu described in roughing it in eighteen hundred and sixty seven he was sent by the alta california as correspondent on the voyage of the quaker city the result was innocents abroad of which a hundred thousand copies were sold the first year for the next four years he lectured successfully in eighteen hundred and seventy he married olivia langdon he bought an interest in the express of buffalo new york where he stayed a year then he moved to hartford in eighteen hundred and seventy three he travelled abroad and lectured in london a year later in eighteen hundred and seventy eight bore fruit in a tramp abroad in eighteen hundred and eighty five he put his fortune and brains into the publishing house of charles l webster and company he was the publisher indeed the instigator and editor of grant's memoirs which was hugely successful but the business failed and clemens assumed the debts of the firm which he paid off by a lecturing tour in eighteen hundred and ninety five to ninety six he spent the next few years in europe after his return to this country he lived in new york and later at stormfield in reading connecticut his works are the celebrated jumping frog eighteen hundred and sixty seven innocence abroad eighteen hundred and sixty nine roughing it eighteen hundred and seventy two the gilded age with charles dudley warner eighteen hundred and seventy three sketches eighteen hundred and seventy five tom sawyer eighteen hundred and seventy six sketches eighteen hundred and seventy eight a tramp abroad eighteen hundred and eighty the prince and the pauper eighteen hundred and eighty two the stolen white elephant etc eighteen hundred and eighty two life on the mississippi eighteen hundred and eighty three huckleberry finn eighteen hundred and eighty four the connecticut yankee in king arthur's coat eighteen hundred and eighty nine merry tales eighteen hundred and ninety two the american claimant eighteen hundred and ninety two the one million pound banknote eighteen hundred and ninety three tom sawyer abroad eighteen hundred and ninety four puddenhead wilson eighteen hundred and ninety four personal recollections of joan of arc eighteen hundred and ninety five following the equator eighteen hundred and ninety seven the man that corrupted hadleyburg eighteen hundred and ninety nine to the person sitting in darkness nineteen hundred and one a double-barrelled detective story nineteen hundred and two king leopold's soliloquy nineteen hundred and five eve's diary nineteen hundred and six christian science nineteen hundred and seven captain stormfield's visit to heaven nineteen hundred and nine is shakespeare dead nineteen hundred and nine speeches nineteen hundred and ten mark twain's biography in three volumes is by his appointed boswell mr albert bigelow payne mark twain's autobiography is to be published complete 
it is understood twenty-five years after his death parts of it have appeared in the north american review mr howells my mark twain is a beautiful book an admirable appreciation is professor brander matthew's introduction to the complete edition of mark twain's works another first-rate essay is that by professor william lyon phelps in essays on modern novelists end of section seventeen read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama section eighteen of the spirit of american literature this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read for you by chiquito crasto the spirit of american literature by john albert macy section eighteen howells in eighteen seventy seven the atlantic monthly gave a dinner in honor of whittier's birthday the howells presided among the honored guests were holmes longfellow and emerson the lion of the party though nobody present knew it was mark twain he told an absurd story which may be read with elucidations in the volume of his speeches an account of the episode is given by mr howells in my mark twain the story represents a western miner telling a stranger about three literary cusses who came to his cabin and who called themselves mr emerson mr longfellow and dr holmes mark twain assumed that because these three distinguished old gentlemen were present at the table in the midst of an immaculate civilization the miner's yarn of three impossible hobos representing themselves as mr longfellow dr holmes and mr emerson would be funny enough and would make everybody feel jolly and take another drink an arctic chill congealed the story as it fell from mark twain's lips nobody was offended really offended but everybody was dismal except the three fine old men of whom the other guests were abjectly pitifully afraid literature was sensible enough for it can always behave in a manly fashion but the appreciation of literature that is the social respect for local greatness was so unsure of itself so cringing and abashed by reputation that it had no true dignity only a bostonian stiffness evidently few large-minded and easy-natured people were present at that dinner professor child was not there he read clemens's speech next day in the newspaper and chuckled the only human laugh known to have been evoked in all new england by mark twain's tragic drollery clemens himself a sensitive self-scrutinizing gentleman was deeply distressed and he suffered long after he left boston and returned to america mr howells the toastmaster not only felt the normal discomfort which every toastmaster feels when somebody whom we have with us tonight makes a fizzle but continued for thirty-five years to deplore mark twain's disastrous blunder he seems not to understand yet what happened he does not by his account perceive that mark twain was the only young man present who behaved like a wholesome human being and that his one mistake was in believing that he had been invited to a pleasant celebration the occasion was really a funeral literature was being buried in boston in thirty-five years it has not been reborn there this little disaster unimportant in itself towers like bunker hill monument in the literary landscape marking the defeat of the local forces it symbolizes the passing of an era it is a milestone as well as a tombstone to read the record of that dinner is to pull the lava of an intellectual pompeii everything in the boston mind is just as it was not a thought has been engendered in any native-born literacy intellect since eighteen seventy seven old boston stands there with the paralyzed gestures of death in life survival it has not even decayed it is simply arrested moveless permanent caught just in the moment when it was putting its last loaf of literary bread into the oven it is real bread a little soggy with the weight of the ashes but well baked and with a quaint lingering savor this is old boston the million beings who go about the streets to-day and do the business of thriving modern boston are a new people 
like the Italians who walk above the graves of Rome, and these new Bostonians have not yet begun to make literature. Mark Twain escaped the fall of ashes and lava and returned to the universe of nature and humanity. One other man, Mr. Howells, was rescued. Having been born in Ohio, he was in part immune against the catastrophe that overtook all thoroughgoing literary Bostonians. His American birth and training preserved him. But he has never been the man he might have been if he had not come under the enervating spell of obsolete pieties. Nature made him witty, genial, sympathetic, observant, and endowed him with an infallible ear for the rhythms of English prose. To read any of the beautiful pages of Venetian life, the book in which he is nearest to being a poet, for in those days romance and youth were still a generous current in his soul. Then to read The Flight of Pony Baker, a delicious boy's book which proves he was incorrigibly young at sixty-five, then to read any of his twenty novels, is to get an impression of a man of rare and diversified gifts born to be one of the great interpreters of human life. But something happened to him. He was stricken by the dead hand in literature. There was in his vicinity no live literature to sustain him, to keep him in a state of courageous contemporaneity, contemporaneity with the world about him. He fell back on the past, and even the seven or eight modern European literatures with which he is familiar are, as he speaks of them, remote, romantic, misty. He writes of Tolstoy as he writes of Jane Austen or Dante. He became the dean of American letters, and there was no one else on the faculty. Huckleberry Finn ran away from school and did not go near college until Yale and Oxford played a joke under cover of the academic twilight and gave him gorgeous red gowns. Mr. Howells was very early Europeanized and Bostonized, and his Ohio outlook on life was dimmed by the fogs of tradition. It was the letter of old Europe and old Boston, not the spirit, that assailed and clouded him. He read French fiction and admired its shapeliness, yet he caught little more from its intensity and candor than a virginal New England schoolmistress might have received. He is as innocent and charmingly so as his own Lydia Blood. He read Tolstoy, and he makes the amazing statement that Tolstoy had a great influence on him. One would hear with no less surprise that Hawthorne was profoundly influenced by Swift and that Jane Austen felt that she had been made over by Rabelais. There is not one trace of the influence of Tolstoy, of Tolstoy's body of thought, soul, purpose, method, power, on any page of Mr. Howells that I have read. Tolstoy's terrific sense of life does not ripple the surface of Mr. Howells' placid, unemotional work, and his essay on Tolstoy is sentimental, feminine, and unimpressive. Someone, was it Mr. George Moore, has said that Mr. Henry James went to Paris and read Turgenev, and that Mr. Howells stayed at home and read Mr. James. This is malicious and probably not true as a matter of biographical fact, but it is aimed near the critical truth. The realistic novel grew up naturally from historic roots in France and in Russia. It was nurtured by a veracity of mind and a social freedom, utterly alien to the hypocrisy and the superficial optimism of America. Mr. Howells and Mr. James, alert to fine achievement, admired this great Slavic and Gallic performance, and they seem to have said, Go to. Realism is a real right thing. We must be realists. They thus accepted the self-imposed limitations of realism, but they could not accept its profound privilege of telling the truth. America would not perhaps have tarred and feathered a man honest and intrepid enough to write as Balzac, Flaubert, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky wrote, but it would not have permitted him to be dean. Mr. Howell's realism is like a French play adapted for our stage. The point of the original is missed, and we wonder, as we watch the Fromanized translation, how Frenchmen can be so dull. To take the method of realism without its substance without its integrity to the bolder passions, results in a work precise in form and excellently finished, but narrow in outlook and shallow. Hamlet and the King's Crime are both left out. Mr. Howells, with no American but Mr. James to invigorate him by contest or support him by intelligent cooperation, got into a cul-de-sac. It looked like the way to a new country, but the way was barred. 
as a critic he became the lone argumentative voice of a realism which he could not practice he could not in his novels illustrate his conviction or make clear what the issue is the issue may be stated roughly as follows fiction is a poetic imitation of biography it makes the magnificent assumption that its characters are real people and proceeds to tell a part of their lives in order to maintain this primary assumption it must do one of two things either it must make events so entertaining that no one cares to question the reality of the people as when achilles slays hector or dido pines for aeneas or it must make the people so real so very similar that no one dares to question their reality romance does the first of these two things the kiss of the fairy prince is so delicious that no one asks whether there ever was a fairy prince realism does the other thing it says that its people are true and are interesting because they are true truth cannot go wrong it must hold the attention of intelligent minds and as for unintelligent minds they may devote themselves to bridge whist and comic operas but having thrown down the gauntlet to falsehood an unlifelike invention realism immediately puts itself under obligation to deal with the whole truth so far as artistic proportions allow it cannot slink behind timid suppressions and reservations and still hope to win in its contest with romance it cannot play with its left hand tied behind its back to the reader of fatuous romance realism says life is more interesting than that read this it is about life and it must offer something really richer and more interesting it must offer tolstoy or balzac what if it offers a modern instance it loses its case at once instead of demonstrating that life is interesting that the commonplace is uncommonly interesting if you get under it and understand it a modern instance demonstrates with fine precision that life is not interesting to the people that live it and that the commonplace is just as commonplace as the romantic had always supposed it to be living people common or extraordinary have passions a modern instance is passionless the people in it with the exception of squire gaylord are not so profoundly moved that the reader catches the contagion of their feelings and their interests mr howells realism proclaiming the identity of life in literature and his critical essays proclaim the same truth many times and in admirable manner leaves the great things in life out if there were no more passion in the world than mr howells recognizes and portrays about 80 million of us americans would never have been born and once born half of us would have died of ennui mr howells says somewhere that he cares only for the thing common or uncommon that reveals its intrinsic poetry that is a right attitude but it is not the attitude of mr howells novels for he is not a poet as meredith and hardy and flaubert are poets he strips life not only of its false romance but of its true romance true realism imaginatively understands the romantic feelings of people in ordinary daylight circumstances a sworn champion of theatric and juvenile romance like stevenson does not need to be argued into liking the great realists fielding or balzac it takes to them naturally because they are rich and humane because they too are men of fancy and see that life is full of terrific tragedies and adventurous comedies mr howells narrow in his convictions and timid in his handling of the very passions which make great realistic novels tilts his lance against stevenson and other men of exuberant fancy and thinks he is fighting the battle of honest fiction he is not and the net result of his critical writings and his novel is to turn the battle against himself seldom in his books does he come to grips with a terrible motive of heart-tearing ecstasy and people have those motives and those ecstasies in real life in a modern instance bartley and marcia are undermotivated bartley goes to the dogs in a true enough way but his beer and his fat are not impressive signs or causes of the disintegration of a weak soul the fat is a pathological fact not at all alien to the noblest character and he does not drink enough in all his recorded career to make an ordinary man drunk for more than a day or two what is the to do all about 
The probable explanation is that, as Theodore Hook said of Wordsworth, Mr. Howell's conceptions of inebriation were no doubt extremely limited. The degeneration of Hubbard's character, which was poor to start with, is sanely probable. It is not inevitable, seen in the light of what the author gives you. One is forced to remember that Mr. Howells was brought up in a community where we were taught in school that to smoke cigarettes was the beginning of the road to the gallows, and all the time we were smoking clay pipes out behind the barn. Marcia Hubbard must have suffered intensely. Her jealousy is a real tragic motive, but nothing is made of it. Her jealousy does not torture us, as does the jealousy of the man in Tolstoy, Kreutzer Sonata. Her story is plain as daylight, for Mr. Howells is a master of clear, self-evident narrative, but there is nothing under it. One can read her story over and over again, without a qualm of sympathy, with not an instant of that vital contact, that emotional identity, which is the reader's great experience in great novels. She is removed from the book on a pair of tongs held by the amiable and delightful Atherton and Clara Kingsbury. We do not care a straw what became of her. The novelist's business is to make us feel that this poor, ignorant, vulgar, jealous girl is tremendously interesting as a victim of herself, even if she has not an intensely interesting personality. Halleck, too, must have had acute feelings. But all one can remember of him is that he was lame, and was very sorry he did not go to Harvard, and that Bartley owed him money. Squire Gaylord has the makings of a great character. He is a real man. He has deep, fundamental emotion. The description of him is excellent, unforgettable. His face looks out of the page. But his tragic climax in the courtroom somehow does not come off. The shrewd pain of the old man, which the recorded events show he must have experienced, is simply not in the book. A modern instance is the best of those novels of Mr. Howells which approach tragedy. It is a good novel, an important novel, but it is not great because the tragic motives are not realized. Its failure is not due to the fact that the characters are sordid and commonplace, as foolish sentimentalists say all about the great ones from Balzac to Zola. Sordid and commonplace people, such as most of us are, have experiences as abysmally tragic are damned with an acute capacities for suffering, as my Lord Hamlet, geniuses like Dostoevsky, and a certain Victorian novelist named Dickens, whom Mr. Howells is reported not to admire, search out of the heart of the very august tragedies in the breasts of ordinary folks and represent them so vividly that it is impossible to be indifferent to their histories. Ordinary persons in real life do extraordinarily interesting things, they have wondrously vivid sensations of commonplace events. Modern novelists have discovered how highly organized is the nervous system of a duffer, how lacerating are his grief and joy. They have also discovered how many interesting things common men do in the course of a day's work. Mr. Howell does not get at all this, because he does not know people and their day's work. He has seen them from his front window and in parlors, offices and summer hotels or he is imaginatively unable to grasp those great moments in the soul, great to the experiencing, if not to the observing soul, those moments which make the person whom the soul inhabits act in absorbingly interesting ways. Either Mr. Howells cannot, or he dare not speak out about life, so that, as the solitary devoted protagonist of realism in these romantic United States, he has been curiously ineffectual. Is he not, after all, a feminine, delicate, slightly romantic genius, theoretically convinced that realism is the thing, but not equipped with the skill and experience to practice it. Seeing that Tolstoy writes of social problems and the people, he would forthwith do likewise, but he does not understand social problems and the people. In short, he does not know life. He would not know how to sit down and eat his grub with a bunch of workmen and find out what they think of things. Yet, theoretically, avowedly, he is all on their side of the social battle. To anyone who has read the literature, not the polite literature, but the daily and the documentary literature of social movements, Mr. Howell's Altruria seems like the sentimentalism of a benevolent man, a fine vision excellently expressed by one who would like to see the social world better, 
but does not know the structure of the social world. A recent paper by Mr. Howells on war shows an astonishing oblivion of all that has been written about the causes of war. He lays a gentle hand on belligerent men and says, This is not nice and humane. He says it for six or seven very fine pages, and the impression is as if an excellent, sincere, dreamy clergyman should accost a girl of the streets and say, Dear, dear, a fallen woman, too bad. Cannot something be done? In Annie Kilburn, some well-to-do people set out to help the poor. The point of the story is that they do not know anything about the poor and do not really sympathize with humanity. Mr. Howells is sympathetic and he understands the false point of view of the people in comfortable circumstances, but he unconsciously reveals his own ignorance of the very people whom Annie Kilburn is supposed to wish to help. He does not portray them. He does not take us into their houses. A Russian or a Frenchman or one of the younger English novelists, Mr. Wells, Mr. Galsworthy or Mr. Bennett, would have us eating dinner with one of the workmen by the third or fourth chapter, and we should know what is thought and felt by the kind of man whom Annie Kilburn is trying to understand. We should see the social contrast dramatized. Mr. Howell's sympathies, principles, methods are modern, advanced, emancipated. His knowledge of things and people is as restricted as that of the New York Nation or the Saturday Review. Life may be a tempest in a teapot. If it is, Mr. Howells is one of its finest and most faithful recorders. But he puts the emphasis on the teapot and not on the tempest, which is hardly consonant with his often restated, almost militant declaration that literature is life. He sees things from a distance. He is a sketcher a very delicate farceur, a war correspondent who has never been in the range of the bullets. The foregoing negations oversay themselves, unless it is understood that Mr. Howells takes literature with tragic seriousness, and that he handles other authors in a very strict and schoolmasterly fashion, so that he is fairly to be judged by his own severe standards of what is worth while in fiction. In his book My Literary Passions, passions. There is the only case in all his work of a misused word, and in his pronouncements from the easy chair and other seats of critical judgment, he has been plain and direct. For all his mild manners and unapproachable tact, in his abuse of some very great writers. Moreover, the negations that are here somewhat awkwardly set down are valid, only on the hypothesis that we are discussing a man of genius, a man worth discussing and are trying to say why an important, capable novelist is not a great one. Within his limits, he is a perfect artist. His slender comedies are without a blemish. He never wrote a bad page, never wrote a sentence that anyone else could make better. Mark Twain has expressed his merit with vigorous justice. For forty years, his English has been to me a continual delight and astonishment. In the sustained exhibition of certain great qualities, clearness, compression, verbal exactness, and unforced and seemingly unconscious felicity of phrasing, he is, in my belief, without his peer in the English writing world. Sustained. I entrench myself behind that protecting word. There are others who exhibit these great qualities as greatly as does he, but only by intervaled distributions of rich moonlight, with stretches of veiled and dimmer landscape between. Whereas Howell's moon sails cloudless skies all night and all the nights. In the matter of verbal exactness, Mr. Howells has no superior, I suppose. He seems to be always able to find that elusive and shifty grain of gold, the right word. And where does he get the easy and effortless flow of his speech, and its cadenced and undulating rhythm, and its architectural felicities of construction, its graces of expression, its pemmican quality of compression, and all that. Born to him, no doubt. All in shining good order in the beginning, all extraordinary. And all just as shining, just as extraordinary today, after forty years of diligent wear and tear and use. As concerns his humour, I will not try to say anything, yet I would try if I had the words that might approximately reach up to its high place. I do not think anyone else can play with humorous fancies so gracefully and delicately and deliciously as he does, nor has so many to play with, nor can come so near making them look 
as if they were doing the playing themselves, and he was not aware that they were at it. For they are unobtrusive and quiet in their ways and well-conducted. His is a humour which flows softly all around, about and over and through the mesh of the page, pervasive, refreshing, health-giving, and makes no more show and no more noise than does the circulation of the blood. If in his many books Mr. Howells has not had a great deal to say that is significant, he has said everything he meant in an unimprovable manner. There are secondary writers who have no influence on our thinking, whose wisdom is not profound, whose ideas we do not vividly recall, for example, Addison, Hawthorne, Potter, but anyone with a sense of literary craftsmanship can read them with pleasure, reread them with increasing admiration. Such a writer is Howells. Even when his story is not quite compelling, his writing fascinates. It is a joy to watch him maneuver the English language. As a writer of superficial, delicate comedy, he is unsurpassed. The lady of the Arustuk is faultless. The surface of it shimmers, and it is all surface. It is one of those stories in which American life is contrasted with European life, but to put it so is to strain its sheer fabric. The international differences are played with in a deft, light-handed way, and there is no assumption, as there is in the graver and richer novels of Mr. Henry James, that national ways and habits are being profoundly studied. The Lady of the Arostook groups itself in the pleasantest corner of the reader's memory with the novels of Jane Austen and Cranford. Matthew Arnold's exclamatory acceptance of it as a specimen of your New England life is a characteristic naivete on the part of one who was forever preaching the need of insight and proportion and the danger of pressing too heavily on a merely literary evidence. There is more of New England life in one of Mrs. Wilkins Freeman's short stories than in any of Howells' novels. Mr. Howells observes life. He is not actually or imaginatively of it. His best comments are objective, pleasantly disdainful. From his point of view, in a corner of a gallery overlooking the human scene, he touches lightly a trick of character and illustrates an unobtrusively neat generality with a trivial action or gesture. He has amazing skill in making conversation clever, but not too clever to be apt on the lips of the postulated character. This skill is constant in his early comedies, The Lady of Arustuk, April Hopes, and Silas Latham, and it is undiminished in The Kentons, written years later. Nor is it much less evident in those novels which are supposed to belong to a different manner, such as The Quality of Mercy, for though Mr. Howell's outlook on life may have undergone radical changes, the texture of his work is much the same for forty years. He very early discovered a fine, definite, narrow gift, and he has employed the gift with unflagging conscience and industry. There is nothing better of its kind than the ball scene in April Hopes, where Mrs. Brinkley and Corey talk about themselves and Boston. There is nothing better than a half-dozen scenes in the Kentons, the conversations on the steamer, especially those in which one is held up by Boyne Kenton, who is certainly the best boy ever put into a grown-up novel, except Clara Middleton's friend Crossjay. Mr. Howell's books are of such even excellence, that perhaps none is unquestionably best, but one vote is cast herewith for the Kentons. There Mr. Howells is getting back home. He knows the Ohio state of mind, at least since there may be no Ohio state of mind, but he knows that one Ohio family and it is an excellent family, in itself as a collection of human beings, and in its artistic entity as a novelist's creation. Bittridge is a sort of Middle Western Bartley Hubbard, but he is much better drawn than the other journalistic bounder. As for the girls, they are a little more warmly and humanely handled than some of the other young people whose love affairs Mr. Howells has graciously sketched. The suffering of the elder daughter is quite poignant and moving. On the whole, Mr. Howell's treatment of young people in love is refreshing in a world full of novels, the chief object of which is to get a man and a girl eagerly into each other's arms on the last page. There is a slight acidity in his management of youthful matings, which make for sanity and never become so sharp as to be unkindly or the least cynical. The grand passions, sexual or other, he does not draw and seldom attempts to draw. 
therefore he has never written a great novel. Biographical note. William Dean Howells was born at Martins Ferry, Ohio, March 1, 1837. He was educated in his father's newspaper office as a compositor and journalist. He wrote a campaign life of Lincoln, for which he was appointed consul at Venice, where he lived from 1861 to 1865. For the next six years, he was associate editor of the New York Nation. From 1872 to 1881, he was editor of the Atlantic Monthly. Since 1886, he has been on the staff of Harper's Magazine. He was married in 1862 to Eleanor G. Meade. Some of his books are Poems of Two Friends with J. J. Piat, 1860, Life of Lincoln, 1860, Venetian Life, 1866, Italian Journeys, 1867, No Love Lost, 1869, Suburban Sketches, 1871, Their Wedding Journey, 1871, Poems, 1873, A Chance Acquaintance, 1873, A Foregone Conclusion, 1874, Out of the Question, 1877, Life of Rutherford B. Hayes, 1877, A Counterfeit Presentment, 1877, The Lady of the Arustuk, 1879, The Undiscovered Country, 1880, A Fearful Responsibility, 1881, Dr. Breen's Practice, 1881, A Modern Instance, 1882, A Woman's Reason, 1883, A Little Girl Among the Old Masters, 1883, Three Villages, 1884, The Rise of Silas Latham, 1885, Tuscan Cities, 1885, The Minister's Charge, 1886, Indian Summer, 1886, Modern Italian Poets, 1887, April Hopes, 1887, Annie Kilburn, 1888, A Hazard of New Fortunes, 1889, The Shadow of a Dream, 1890, A Boy's Town, 1890, An Imperative Duty, 1891, The World of Chance, 1893, The Coast of Bohemia, 1893, A Traveller from Altruria, 1894, My Literary Passions, 1895, Stops of Various Quills, 1895, Impressions and Experiences, 1896, An Open-Eyed Conspiracy, 1897, Raggedy Lady, 1899, Their Silver Wedding Journey, 1899, Literary Friends and Acquaintance, 1900, Heroines of Fiction, 1901, The Kentons, 1902, Literature and Life, 1902, The Flight of Pony Baker, 1902, Questionable Shapes, 1903, Letters Home, 1903, Miss Bellard's Inspiration, 1905, London Films, 1905, Certain Delightful English Towns, 1906, Between the Dark and the Daylight, 1907, Through the Eye of the Needle, 1907, The Mother and the Father, 1909, Seven English Cities, 1909, My Mark Twain, 1910. Mr. Howells is happily living, so that no one has yet written his biography. The only good essays about him that I have seen are one by John M. Robertson in Essays Toward a Critical Method and one by Mark Twain in Harper's Magazine for July 1906. End of section 18. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Section 19 of The Spirit of American Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. The Spirit of American Literature by John Albert Macy. Section 19. William James. William James was one of three or four important American men of letters of his generation and it is as man of letters and human being not as technical philosopher that we shall discuss him here to be sure the professional and the literary aspects of this multitudinously gifted man are not to be completely separated so far as a maker of books is identified with a limited subject he must be judged by the standard special to that subject and james was a philosopher he wrote little outside metaphysics and psychology 
not to discuss him as philosopher would be to neglect his chief importance but when a writer by virtue of his personality stands forth from the technicalities of his subject and captures imaginations that are not wont to dwell in the special field where he labors he becomes a man of letters and the man of letters survives after the philosopher has been tucked away in museums universities and other preservative institutions it is sometimes the case that the lesser philosopher is the greater man of letters or that the untechnical aspects or portions of a philosopher's work most broadly secure his immortality schopenhauer compels admiration from florid optimists and from idle readers of literature who care nothing for his fundamental theories whereas kant assumed to be a greater philosopher than schopenhauer exhausted every resource of human thought and the german language to discourage people from reading him it is certainly not plato's metaphysics but the portrait of socrates the poetic fanciful talk of the master and the young men which outlive the centuries if the absolute should open its thin lips and declare all james's philosophy null and void james would march prospering just the same overriding with his cavalry charges of living illustration all the inhibitions of philosophy or any creature thereof it is high time he says to urge the use of a little imagination in philosophy he used not little but much he has the vision the fertility the abundance of analogy which he ascribes to fechner and which he says professorial philosophers usually lack systems die but vision is imperishable poets speak with still living voices long after their private beliefs and religions have become dead issues transcendentalism is deader than marley's ghost but emerson is not dead pragmatism may become a dead issue but the great expounder of it has embedded its principles in vital matter less ephemeral less transitory than the stuff of many famous books of philosophy every theory every article of faith which james declared grew out of the soil of life and was fostered by the most opulent and incandescent imagination among americans of the generation that is now at threescore years and ten there is only one other of william james's stature and originality mark twain even the fine novelists mr howells and mr henry james are not the human equals of those two in all departments of life which he touched william james was a liberator a champion of human rights and the privileges of the spirit a redeemer of his age from stupidity and commonplaceness and intellectual tyranny he was of the few who reclaimed the arid desert which american literature had been since the passing of their father's generation he redeemed philosophy from rigid and jejune abstraction made it alive for living people and tried to make living people alive to philosophy he was one of a small band who redeemed the humanistic departments of harvard university from the sterility and impotence into which they had fallen during the past twenty-five years the teacher the philosopher the man of letters does he seem to shine the more brilliantly in all three capacities because he had so little competition in his immediate environment because great teachers do not as a rule live in university communities because philosophers do not live in the midst of life and men of letters contemporary with james almost unanimously refused to be born in these united states he was a great teacher in a university where a dozen years ago surely great teachers were few in the non-scientific departments there was norton a survival from a generation that read literature and knew not phds there was also one teacher of literature whose merited popularity with his students vainly clamored in administrative ears for official recognition which is even now incompletely accorded and there was the department of philosophy these were the only men who produced anything like literature who could do that which they presumed to teach in his talks to teachers 
james says with mild irony that all we need to do now is to impregnate our organized education with geniuses he well knew that genius or even a conspicuous talent is the most serious disqualification with which a man can be burdened if he wishes to teach in an american school in his sketch of thomas davidson who might have added lustre to harvard had the authorities willed to receive him into the faculty james protests against the disposition of university officials to reject men of ability in favor of routine professors the reason of course is that routine professors are already in charge and they cannot endure the rivalry of first-rate intellects the sections of the harvard faculty which deal with art and letters those departments which should have a great civilizing influence which should inspire young men with poetry and beauty and feed their imaginations have all been benighted in routine save only the department of philosophy palmer royce santayana and james it alone is impregnated with genius its members write significant books to a small group of men and to james especially is due the spiritual salvation of harvard or as much of harvard as the faculty constitutes during an administration which was hostile to a good deal that is important in education an administration the more discouraging because so servilely praised a true disciple of james should hasten to add that harvard has not been guilty of any unique individual stupidity for our master tells us that most human institutions by the purely technical and professional manner in which they come to be administered end by becoming obstacles to the very purposes which their founders had in view james's talks to teachers is one of those rare manuals of advice whose precepts the counsellor himself put into practice he treated his pupils as human beings he assumed them to be intelligent gentlemen and by this assumption it illustrates one of the principles of his psychology he helped them to be so their views and interests were to him not juvenile inferiorities to which gowned wisdom graciously condescended they were equal democratic human stuff valuable to the man who sat on the other side of the desk for he was a real philosopher of the race of socrates in a subject like philosophy he says it is really fatal to lose connection with the open air of human nature and to think in terms of shop tradition only he talked to his classes as man to man urbane gracious witty and withal vastly learned he unrolled his wisdom without pretension and without the wrong kind of reservation to use his own words he forgot scruples took the break off his heart and let his tongue wag the writer remembers one little accident that resulted from his off-hand liberal way of talking philosophy the subject was a volume of metaphysical theology a wise but rather dull book in which the author had mingled together his traditional deity and an abstraction as shapeless as a cloud and less substantial consisting of the babu words of philosophy in the thicket of words some of us were resignedly losing ourselves and we expected to be lost throughout the course but after a lecture or two of preliminaries the thicket became alive vistas opened not toward the absolute to which the book was driving but to all manner of lighted clearings and glades of intelligence the discourses were unmethodical colloquial yet the method of a mind that had already thought out most of the things discussed in the book soon became evident the papery attributes of the figment in the textbook were peeled off one after another and thrown into the waste basket one day with his delightful mixture of alertness and nonchalance james was reducing a word to its meanings trying to find the heart of it by pulling away some of its connotations there was no heart in it one student who had not quite followed the game and still mistook the faceless abstraction for the god of his fathers 
grew aghast at the process of verbal denudation and cried out but i do not see how that takes away my god professor james paused for a puzzled moment and then replied it doesn't your god stands on his own hind legs then he pursued the idea often found in his books that the metaphysical absolute is like an anatomist's mannequin it can be taken apart and put together it may be a useful diagram of a living being but it is itself dead since he permitted himself such homely metaphors indeed he took pleasure in a slang trope politely apologizing for its vulgarity one may say that his philosophy stands on its own hind legs and he left standing-room for other men's convictions he respected what stands alone and was suspicious of artificial props exuberant foe of all ghostly abstractions and of reasons that smack of intellectual dishonesty he deferred humbly to the faiths and feelings of men he was a learner at the feet of life and in that attitude he kept his students but to represent him so the words are at fault savors of a sort of pious solemnity quite foreign to his spirit of animated discursive inquiry most often he took his students on holiday explorations and in the midst of an intellectual picnic he turned poet and prophet and spoke with an eloquence which no man less than a genius can approach when his discourses take shape in print they retain their colloquial informality and gain heightened power from compression and rearrangement his psychology however solid a textbook it may be is really a series of literary essays if the chapter on habit were bound in a volume of stevenson or emerson it might surprise us there but it would not be inharmonious with its surroundings other philosophers talk of previous philosophers and of such ancient literature as has become respectable and dignified james refers abundantly to modern poets and essayists whitman richard jefferies edward carpenter swinburne tennyson tolstoy james thompson thackeray chesterton and h g wells some psychologists throw life into rigid cold shadows cast by an artificial light james views the world in the sunlight of nature which overflows and streams beyond the shadow-casting facts his varieties of religious experience is an anthology of poetry and biography a study not of theologies but of human beings there is something capaciously tolerant about the book as if the mind that made it were large enough to understand and value any sort of man even though candor flatly rejected his religion in pragmatism and the meaning of truth and a pluralistic universe where he is fighting a dexterous and exhilarating battle james is dignified and dead in earnest yet capable of hearty laughter my failure he says in making converts to my conception of truth seems almost complete an ordinary philosopher would feel disheartened and a common choleric sinner would curse god and die whether or not one is converted to his conception it is impossible not to be converted to the man what we enjoy most in a huxley or a clifford he says is not the professor with his learning but the human personality ready to go in for what it feels to be right in spite of all appearances much of james's work is a war of words that is a war of life against words for this task no man was ever better fitted they who would nip pragmatism in the bud an operation which one critic regards as the present duty of philosophy must choose sharp hard weapons lest the assaulting edges be nicked on the steel they encounter james outstrips all his rivals in his power over language language professional and colloquial diurnal and traditional if there be reason in the old idea that clarity of statement is proof of truth 
he is unassailably true he has defined himself in his account of bergson if anything can make hard things easy to follow it is a style like bergson's a straightforward style an american reviewer lately called it failing to see that such straightforwardness means a flexibility of verbal resource that follows the thought without crease or wrinkle as elastic underclothing follows the movements of one's body the lucidity of bergson's way of putting things seduces you and bribes you in advance to become his disciple it is a miracle and he is a real magician james too is straightforward rapid luminous moreover he has a humour rare in philosophers a whimsical wayward style of sliding round venerable monuments of superstition a variety and adaptability not only to his argumentative purpose but to the moods of human beings the expositor writes at his subject the man of letters writes at living persons james strikes like a poet at the middle of your nature and discovers what only the man of sympathy can give you courage to feel that the avenues of approach to your centre of intelligence are populous with ideas no doubt his eloquence is a consolation to his opponents who will take refuge in the inhuman notion that true wisdom is dull and that beauty is meretricious but james has himself swept away the classroom fallacy that stupidity of expression is a warrant of philosophic profundity his chapter on hegel in a pluralistic universe is a declaration of independence one article of which relates to the question of style there seems something grotesque and so grenu in the pretension of a style so disobedient to the first rules of sound communication between minds to be the authentic mother-tongue of reason james is a master of words and his mastery has fitted him to clear away some towering structures that forbade a free passage to the open country he has pierced many frowning champions and found them like the formidable knight of arthurian legend to hold but a weak boy inside the shining accoutrement he knew the core and fringes of terms and was not to be deceived by the fallacies involved in them he delighted to shake a philosophic word and make it give up its meaning or give up the ghost too many words he thought gave up nothing but ghosts he liked to strip a phrase of its ancestral respectability to wipe off its satellitious splendors and send it into a fight with life and see it come back bruised and faint he enjoyed pulling a formulated solemnity from its precarious one-sided attachment to a metaphysical edifice and then scrutinizing the fragments but he was destructive only in the interests of clarity and honesty the superficial mistook his dexterity and lightness of heart for frivolity his ready metaphor about the cash value of an idea has even been so far debased by a foreign critic as to be used in proof of the commercialism of america as he cries oh for the rarity of ordinary secular intelligence james destroyed sanctified verbalisms because he distrusted the impositions of mere words his main interest was not words but life to the ordinary inquisitive mind philosophy is a region of spectres and vapours it is not full of substantial things james strides out of the misty bog to the shining uplands of human life he knew the world he was a man of sound information a biologist a reader of contemporary writings and contemporary events when he spoke of political and moral problems it was not from an academic twilight but from the highway where he walked with other men in our time we are losing respect for ordinate authority we expect the philosopher and other leaders of thought to make good james called upon himself and his colleagues to give an account of themselves not only as professors but as men 
humbug is humbug he says even though it bear the scientific name that confession is one that the common citizen has been demanding for a long time we are suspicious of what james calls the common herd of philosophic scribes it was time we had a professor whose pages should glow with sincerity it was high time especially in new england universities that the grand lamas of learning should be made to realize that they live in our world that they cannot withdraw to the lofty remoteness of tibet however much they may prefer the climate we are beginning to count the cost of the inefficient church and the inefficient university we are trying to clear our shoddy and cotton skirts which inefficient statesmanship sells to us at all wool prices from the briars of bewilderment we are striving to find a way out to things that matter to make our lives and schools and governments better in this struggle james was a liberator he justified his academic tribe as he jokingly says he tried to earn his salary as a full professor he was impatient with the nonsense of his class because he had sympathy for other classes he did not try to allay but vigorously stirred the ferment of rebellion which is boiling over the walls of institutionalism in all parts of the world mark twain has been mentioned in this chapter partly for the pleasure of imagining the shock which the association of the two men might give to critical souls but chiefly because the association is just they are the two splendid figures in the pitifully small number of american humanists of their generation they both had heart and humor and eloquence and humanity footnote it may not be indiscreet to give in a footnote an example of james's whole-souled manner of recognizing contemporary idealisms of his readiness to throw scholarly apparatus overboard and go straight to essential truth there has been much psychological and much pseudo-psychological discussion of miss helen keller professor james wrote to her in praise of one of her books after some lively compliments about her psychology and her literary gifts he said the sum of it is that you're a blessing and i'll kill any one that says you're not lest the reader far from boston may take this for granted and say of course she was at radcliffe he was a harvard professor and harvard professors must necessarily have been enthusiastic about this wonderful student i may add that in this james seems to be as much an exception to the temper of official cambridge as he was an exception in many other significant things End of footnote. it is usual to speak of mark twain as a philosopher in the popular sense of the word professional philosophers ignore that sense but james did not ignore it he valued it and bade his colleagues relate their philosophies to popular meanings to the experiences of common humanity our universities cannot be wholly useless when a college professor a lecturer upon abstruse problems can write as james wrote in eighteen ninety nine in the preface of his talks to teachers the practical consequence of such a philosophy the belief that the facts and worth of life need many cognizers to take them in is the well-known democratic respect for the sacredness of individuality is at any rate the outward tolerance of whatever is not itself intolerant these phrases are so familiar that they sound now rather dead in our ears once they had a passionate inner meaning such a passionate inner meaning they may easily acquire again if the pretension of our nation to inflict its own inner ideals and institutions v et armis upon orientals should meet with a resistance as obdurate as so far it has been gallant and spirited religiously and philosophically our national doctrine of live and let live may prove to have a far deeper meaning than our people now seem to imagine it to possess biographical note william james was born in new york city january eleventh eighteen forty two he died in cambridge massachusetts august twenty sixth nineteen ten 
his father was henry james the swedenborgian writer mr henry james the novelist is his brother he studied at the lawrence scientific school and graduated from the harvard medical school in eighteen sixty nine he taught at harvard from eighteen seventy two to nineteen hundred and seven as instructor in physiology and anatomy then as professor of philosophy and psychology he gave the gifford lectures at edinburgh eighteen ninety nine to nineteen eleven and the hibbert lectures at oxford in nineteen hundred and eight in eighteen seventy eight he married alice h gibbons his works are principles of psychology eighteen ninety psychology briefer course eighteen ninety two the will to believe and other essays in popular philosophy eighteen ninety seven talks to teachers on psychology and to students on life's ideals eighteen ninety eight human immortality two supposed objections to the doctrine eighteen ninety nine the varieties of religious experience nineteen hundred and two pragmatism a new name for some old ways of thinking nineteen hundred and seven a pluralistic universe nineteen hundred and eight the meaning of truth nineteen hundred and nine some problems of philosophy nineteen eleven memories and studies nineteen eleven essays in radical empiricism nineteen twelve end of section nineteen section twenty of the spirit of american literature this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org read for you by chiquito crasto the spirit of american literature by john albert macy section twenty lanier three volumes of unimpeachable poetry have been written in america Leaves of Grass, the thin volume of Poe, and the poetry of Sidney Lanier. It is treading on treacherous negatives to say that there is not a fourth fit for their society. Yet I believe that to make an adequate fourth, one would have to assemble in an anthology the finest poems from lesser lyrists, beginning perhaps with Bryant's Waterfowl, and including, if not ending with, the remarkable poems published only last year. The Singing Man by Josephine Preston Peabody, Mrs. Marx, and a beautiful book that anthology would be, for it would contain Freneau's Wild Honeysuckle, Parsons on a Bust of Dante, and Dirge for One Who Fell in Battle, Timrod's Cotton Bowl, Stedman's John Brown and Helen Keller, Aldrich's Fredericksburg and Identity, Sills' The Fool's Prayer, Gilder's Sonnet on the Life Mask of Lincoln, a score of marvellous little poems by Father Tabb, James Whitcomb Riley's South Wind and the Sun, Emma Lazarus's Venus of the Louvre, L. F. Tucker's The Last Fight, a dozen lyrics of Richard Hovey, William Vaughan Moody's Gloucester Moors, four or five poems by Edwin Arlington Robinson, and some other verse drawn from the younger rather than the elder poets. Surely, it would be a fragrant cluster from many gardens whose beauty is a splendid and consoling denial that the race of singers is dead or shall ever die till man dies if this anthology made of poets who are somewhat invidiously and with wavering justice of phrase called minor were ranked on our shelves with the complete works of american poets what single light could shine undiminished by the rivalry of the chosen cluster of perfection not Longfellow, nor Whittier, nor Holmes, nor Lowell, but only these three, Poe, Whitman, Lanier. Lanier was a poet, always, continuously, even in his juvenile verses, and his genius was unerringly self-recognized before the bitter exigencies of his life permitted him to announce himself and to prove his modestly proud conviction. No poet's lot, except Poe's, ever fell in ruggeder places, no poet except Poe was so alone and self-directed. A letter written when he was thirty-three to Bayard Taylor set forth the aridity of his life. I could never describe to you what a mere drought and famine my life has been as regards that multitude of matters which I fancy one absorbs when one is in the atmosphere of art 
or when one is in conversational relation with men of letters with travellers with persons who have either seen or written or done large things perhaps you know that with us of the younger generations in the south since the war pretty much the whole of life has been merely not dying to his father he writes my dear father think how for twenty years through poverty through pain through weariness through sickness through the uncongenial atmosphere of a farcical college and of a bare army and then of an exacting business life through all the discouragement of being wholly unacquainted with literary people and literary ways i say think how in spite of all these depressing circumstances and of a thousand more which i could enumerate these two figures of music and poetry have steadily kept in my heart so that i could not banish them these letters are a sad commentary on america not that poets have not been lonely and discouraged in other countries for they not only reveal a war wasted south but remind us how very little lanier missed at that date in not being associated with men of letters of new york and new england the man he writes to like an outsider yearning for good company is bayard taylor a first-rate man but a fourth-rate literature the friendliness of baltimore finally gave him much that he needed and wonder of wonders johns hopkins university made him instructor in literature the new young college thought a true poet worthy to teach literature and help a true poet to live lanier flourished alone and taught himself all that he knew of books and poetry indeed he learned without a teacher to play the flute so well that he could support himself by playing in the orchestra at baltimore and was pronounced by professional musicians a distinguished player in a somewhat florid but evidently sincere memorial the leader of the orchestra said i will never forget the impression he made on me when he played the flute concerto of emil hartmann at a peabody symphony concert in eighteen seventy eight his tall handsome manly presence his flute breathing noble sorrows noble joys the orchestra softly responding the audience was spellbound such distinction such refinement he stood the master the genius and he had never had a lesson in music when he died at thirty-nine he had made himself a technically excellent musician within ten years for his literary life had scarcely begun before he was thirty he had fitted himself to give lectures on the english novel shakespeare and old english poets he had written the most original treatise in existence on english verse equalled so far as i know that kind of literature only by the studies of poe and coleridge and he was the unapproachably best american poet of his generation if ever there was a born genius since keats it was lanier let there be no sentimentalizing over him for he was a man of humor he spoke always of his difficulties in a manly fashion and when death strides into his pages it is an honest figure and not a personification of the tuberculosis against which the poet fought to victorious defeat but if ever lamentation for a poet's death be justifiable there may well be a cry of pain for the unfinished hymns of the marshes his voice was growing greater when he ceased to sing and like keats his angel's tongue lost half the sweetest song was ever sung he bided his time he wrote little verse he studied all aspects of his art intensely patiently with a religious conscience how sure and strong in his growth is wonderfully shown by comparing the two following poems the first written when he was twenty-four and not published by him and the second written ten years later a perfect lyric night fair is the wedded rain of night and day each rules a half of earth with different sway exchanging kingdoms east and west all way like the round pearl that egypt drunk in wine the sun half sinks in the brimming rosy brine the wild night drinks all up how her eyes shine evening song look off dear love across the sallow sands and mark you meeting of the sun and sea how long they kiss in sight of all the lands ah longer longer we now in the sea's red vintage melts the sun as egypt's pearl dissolved in rosy wine 
and cleopatra night drinks all tis done love lay thine hand in mine come forth sweet stars and comfort heaven's heart glimmer ye waves round else unlighted sands o night divorce our sun and sky apart never our lips our hands yet it is not for what he might have done but for what he did that the impartial assessment of time will sum his merits it is humane to remember that he wrote a sunrise the year before he died when he was too ill to eat and his temperature was at one hundred and four then it is well to remove all the cross lights of biography and stand face to face with a sunrise a poem magnificent in conception perfect in workmanship ultimate poetry the following lines are the close of the poem good morrow lord sun with several voice with a scription one the woods and the marsh and the sea and my soul unto thee whence the glittering stream of all morrows doth roll cry good and past good and most heavenly morrow lord sun o artisan born in the purple workman heat parter of passionate atoms that travail to meet and be mixed in the death-cold oneness innermost guest at the marriage of elements fellow of publicans blessed king in the blouse of flame that loiterest o'er the idle skies yet laborest fast evermore thou in the fine forge thunder thou in the heat of the heart of man thou motive laborer heat yea artist thou of whose art you seize all news with his inshore greens and manifold mid-sea blues pearl glint shell tint ancientest perfectest hues ever shaming the maidens lily and rose confess thee and each mild flame that glows in the clarified virginal bosoms of stones that shine it is thine it is thine thou chemist of storms where the driving the winds a swirl or a flicker the subtiler essences polar that whirl in the magnet earth yea thou with a storm for a heart rent with debate many spotted with question part from part oft sundered yet ever a globed light yet ever the artist ever more large and bright than the eye of man may avail off manifold one i must pass from thy face i must pass from the face of the sun old want is awake and a gag every wrinkle a frown the worker must pass to his work in the terrible town but i fear not nay and i fear not in the thing to be done i am strong with the strength of my lord the sun how dark how dark soever the race that needs be run i am lit with the sun o oh, never the mast high run of the seas of traffic shall hide thee never the hell-coloured smoke of the factories hide thee never the reek of time's fen politics hide thee and ever my heart through the night shall with knowledge abide thee and ever by day shall my spirit as one that hath tried thee labour at leisure in art till yonder beside thee my soul shall float friend son the day being done a blood brother to lanier's sunrise is francis thompson's ode to the setting sun and i know not a third which is so closely its kin these poems have much in common opulence splendor of metaphor and an amazing virtuosity in metrical matters which in turn allies them with swinburne from whom in thought they are however as remote as poets can be if thomson did not know the poems of lanier it is a case of predetermined affinities which the accidents of circumstance cheated off the earthly fulfilment of meeting have they some common earlier master that i do not know or is the identity of these powerful metaphors less striking than i find it thompson whether man's heart or life it be which yields the harvest must thy harvest fields be dunged with rotten death lanier mulched with unsavoury death gross soul unto such white estate that virginal prayerful art shall be thy breath thy work thy fate one other resemblance resides in their work in their convictions the fresh vigour they have given to the symbols of christianity which had well nigh perished out of modern poetry blighted by the ugliness of sincere but graceless hymn writers 
and other devotees whom the pagan muses had abandoned in despair and both used the symbols rather for their beauty than for their religious import to say at once the worst that can be said of either of them both thompson and lanier are subject to the same temptation or they are driven to the brink of the same danger and both triumphantly avoid falling into the abyss where poetry ceases and mere metricism begins they are both so abundant in fancy and over flooded with metaphors and withal so adept at playing with measures that now and again their exuberance and nimbleness almost betray them but because they are both austere artists and passionately intend what they say they are saved it is a danger merely and they tremble on the verge of it one would gladly strike out of thompson the two visibly crafty rhymes of such a poem as to the dead cardinal strange subject for him to spoil with conceited fantastic versifying and one would as gladly prune out some of lanier's internal rhyming and obvious assonances in both poets who are in the main steadied by the solid burden of thought they carry so highly on the breast of a song the fault is due to an intoxication from the sound of words the best of the elizabethan and seventeenth century poets of england were not free from the fantastic which is a greater pleasure to the skilful verse-maker than any but poets realize in the nineteenth century swinburne in the very ecstasy of making new meters and reviving old ones flies sometimes on dizzy and purposeless wings and it may be that the younger poets lanier and thompson learn from him his less admirable as well as his most admirable lessons in prosody however they sin but little and this is the all immortalizing distinction they sin as poets not as versifiers that lanier was a musician as well as a poet is there any other professional musician in english poetry and that he expressed his theory in the science of english verse are facts caught at too eagerly by those who would account for some of his most evidently musical arrangements of words the truth about him as about all artists is that his theory followed his art he was a poet first and a student or rather a professor of technique afterward his theory of verse merely codifies with such technical knowledge as only a musician has the fact which all poets instinctively know and all true poetry exemplifies that poetry is in half its nature music and that it consists not of spoken words but of chanted words professional students of prosody who are not poets and most are not have applied to ancient and modern poetry a kind of visual mathematics and they discourse of greek measure and english as if they were quite different things but their laws are precisely the same they are oral laws determined by the human ear which is pleased or offended musically by all verse greek french english or south sea island there is only one law for all music and for all poetry independent of the explicit meaning necessarily resident in human words and that law is if it sounds right it is right the counting of feet is superfluous if they are to be counted at all lanier's way is the way to count the principles he expounds were known to the ear that first heard homer lanier's verse being true to english poetry to the effects of english words on the ear would probably have been what it is if he had never been an instructor and a technically capable musician and had never expounded his principles indeed if he had been free to write poetry he would not have written the science of english verse a professor cannot earn his salary by reading original poetry to a class but he can earn it by lecturing on the science of verse all true artists know the grammar of their art thoroughly not merely with such practitioner's knowledge as a carpenter has of geometry but with the highest kind of theoretic intelligence for artists have the best human minds and are the final speculators about the laws which they obey any great novelist could take a month off and write a book about the art of fiction but few novelists put themselves to so much trouble because they are busy writing novels and therefore the making of books of theory is left in the less capable hands of critics who would fain be literary men but cannot to save their souls write novels wagner has not the time to write a schoolmaster's treatise on harmony and such a treatise would probably bore chopin to tears lanier is not more theoretic than other poets he was simply so circumstanced that to keep his head up as a lecturer 
he made a book about poetry when he would unquestionably have preferred to give his energy to writing poetry. All modern poets have been overwhelmed by the beauty of ancient poets. They have fed on the classics, sometimes assimilating them so thoroughly as to build new tissue of the divine nutriment, sometimes, far too often, trailing an undigested pseudo-classicism across their pages. The very modern poets have at once a double resource and a double burden, for they have both the very ancient poets and the tremendous body of poetry in living languages on which to feed and by which to kill themselves. It is a very striking quality of Lanier that he thoroughly assimilates his masters. He does not mix Shakespeare with Lanier, but renews a Shakespearean phrase, treating the Elizabethan as a great thing in nature, from which to draw metaphors. To put it another way, he does not lean upon Shakespeare. He does not merely reflect a moonlit beauty from great poets, like those rhymesters who get a kind of borrowed sweetness into their work by writing sonnets to Shelley. Lanier Shakespearean metaphors sound poetic and not bookish. Old Hill, Old Hill, thou gashed and hairy leer, whom the divine Cordelia of the year, e'en pitying spring, will vainly strive to cheer. Again of the mocking bird, which Lanier by a splendid revolt has finally put on his rightful seat, supplanting the European tyrants, Nightingale and Skylark, how may the death of the dull insect be? The life of you trim Shakespeare on the tree. If haply thou, O Desdemona, mourn, shouldst call along the curving sphere, remain, dear knight, sweet moor, over the monstrous shambling sea, over the Caliban sea, bright aerial cloud, thou lingerest. O oh, wait, O oh, wait in the warm red west, thy Prospero I'll be. Selection does him wrong by false emphasis, and the foregoing may give the impression that he is overfond of literary illusion. But the quotations I give are all there, are of the kind. The purpose of quoting them is to suggest that Lanier was in a sense a fresh unschooled discoverer of the poets. They did not become stale with classroom familiarity while he was young. He loved them as part of nature, as Keats discovered and loved Chapman and Spencer. How far he was from abject worship of his poet heroes is shown in the crystal, in which is wrought out with telling phrases that are marvels of criticism, the bold and refreshing idea that all the masters of song, Shakespeare, Homer, Dante, have much to be forgiven. That is a great poem in which a poet adequately praises another, in which he does not droop upon a greater strength, but stands, for one song's duration at least, the equal of his adored. Such poem is that To Our Mocking Bird, where the bird and Keats are identified and the cat and death are rebuked together. Lanier, like all his race of poets, sang praises to his fathers in melody. Yet he does not smell of the library. He is a poet of nature and of things, of the meaning of central present things that harry and strengthen the heart of man. In corn, for once an American poet strode into our splendid native golden fields and sang what his eyes saw, and deeper, what the harvests of the fields can be for man. The symphony, in which the instruments he knew so well are soundingly suggested, is no mere interplay of melodies, but the cry of the old new spirit of brotherhood against the debauchery of trade. By it Lanier becomes one of the goodly band of modern men dissatisfied with man's violations of man, and his voice is strong enough to admit him to the still smaller band of poets, who are the voices of the present life, of these very times, with Morris and Whitman, whom, alas, he did not like. Oddly, he, the devotee of pure music, dared the historic theme which so many Americans have tried, ever since the absurd columbiads of the early years of the nation, and in the psalm of the West, he did make a chant of America and freedom, which has in its short compass something like epic vision, and is, if not the noblest of Lanier, far above most patriotic verse, and artistically excellent. Lanier stands alone in that era of American poetry, which is chiefly marked by a false post-Tennysonism, an era of nicely made lyrics that have neither passion nor an individual sense of beauty. There are today signs of something better, nay, distinguished specimens of something better, 
in such works as mrs mark's the singing man which is a pleasure to name again and in mr r h schoffler's scum of the earth if lanier had no equal contemporaries he may have successors for when an age is shuddering on its first gray verge and its day facts lie in the future it is permitted to be hopeful for it biographical note sydney lanier was born at macon georgia february third eighteen forty two he died at lynn north carolina september seventh eighteen eighty one he learned as a boy to play several musical instruments which instead of delighting his friends and parents alarmed them at the age of eighteen he graduated from oglethorpe college a presbyterian institution in georgia which he later called farcical in april eighteen hundred and sixty one he enlisted in the confederate army and served through the war it is a picturesque fact that he carried his flute with him through battle and imprisonment the war broke his health and he was never afterward free from consumption until eighteen seventy two he was in business and in the practice of law in eighteen seventy three he settled in baltimore and supported himself as flute player in the peabody orchestra he lived the rest of his life in baltimore except for vain excursions in quest of health some public lectures on literature and some of his poems brought him to the notice of president d c gilman who appointed him lecturer on english literature at johns hopkins university in eighteen sixty seven he married mary day his books are tiger lilies a novel eighteen sixty seven florida its scenery history and climate eighteen seventy six poems eighteen seventy six the boys frossard eighteen seventy eight the science of english verse eighteen eighty the boys king arthur eighteen eighty the boys mabinogion eighteen eighty one the boys percy eighteen eighty two the english novel and the principles of its development eighteen eighty three poems eighteen eighty four eighteen ninety one letters eighteen ninety nine shakespeare and his forerunners nineteen hundred and two poem outlines nineteen hundred and eight the life of lanier in american man of letters is by edward mims End of section 20. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Section 21 of The Spirit of American Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. The Spirit of American Literature by John Albert Macy, Section Twenty One, Henry James. There is a sort of poetic justice in the fact that Mr. James, a fine and exacting critic, should have evoked from other critics an interesting and provocative variety of opinion, both for him and against him. People whose business it is to write about literature have put their best brains forward those who attend to him at all sit on the edge of their chairs and thereby agree however otherwise they may differ that they are in the presence of an unusual mind he is already a celebrated argument and there are accepted clichés of him some complimentary some not quite just in the minor humours of the press undoubtedly vulgar as he would hasten to tell us if he had occasion to animadvert on it his name is like browning's synonymous with obscurity with all that suggests height of brow and a liking for the raffiné it is not quite appropriate that such notoriety should attend the work of a man who has pursued his career in modest retirement who has never stood out and fought for his public like ibsen and who has not been rewarded by the popularity which helps to make notoriety palatable he has won and held a small public creating in it a taste for himself as meredith did and being like meredith again a fine example of the man of letters who follows his own course and lets the people talk the people or at least the critics have talked whether they have read him or not in a way some of his friendliest critics have done less good than harm for they have a habit of assuming that to understand him one has to be a very unusually intelligent person which is like the fundamental fallacy of the browning societies mr james is an american only in the sense that he was born and passed part of his youth in this country 
for forty years he has lived in europe and he does not know much about america it is a visitor and not a native who writes the american scene the characters in his novels are individuals selected out of their habitual environment and without much of any soil clinging to their boots the world is small nowadays and since mr james does not deal with rooted people but with persons whatever their nationality who are in social circumstances which permit them to travel freely he carries his country under his hat and he can study it just as well in london as in florence in rome as in chicago his expatriation is really less significant than washington irving's long sojourn abroad his attitude however is rather british than american for he takes british people more for granted any american reader feels at home with the english characters in english novels miss austin's country families the people of trollope of mr arnold bennett of mr h g wells sit beside our fires and talk and smoke make love and trouble just like our neighbors but when an american character walks into an english novel the novelist infallibly tells you in as many different ways as he can think of that this is an american though the character may do nothing but look at his watch or flirt with a girl behave in a quite ordinary way the novelist gets uneasy and begins to hunt for national differences american novelists do the same sort of thing mr howells always takes american people for granted but if an english woman appears on the scene he lets you know that she is english not merely by stating the plain fact but by comments and inklings of national peculiarities so marked is this tendency that mr john m robertson the scotch critic notes and especially enjoys mr howells's attitude toward the english to be sure in their international novels mr james and mr howells make comments on both english and american characteristics they reveal themselves by what they take for granted judged by this sort of evidence mr james gives himself away to an american as being british we cannot however yield him from our poverty to the riches of the english novel moreover the important thing is not so much the settling of a boundary dispute as the fact that mr james ignorant of the american at home fails to make the social contrasts in which he is so much interested his chief interest of course is not in social backgrounds but in individuals whom he minutely and faithfully studies but when he does try to make a plunge into a national depth he merely goes through a paper hoop he is in the same atmosphere not a different one in the wings of the dove he brings the secondary heroine the dove herself from america she might just as well have been born in an english city wealth hair purity intensity oddity fragility and all her companion mrs stringham the lady from boston may be typically bostonian but there is nothing about her essential to the story that might not have been born in liverpool or edinburgh because mr james makes a good deal of her past there must have been some feeling on his part that he was bringing together significantly specimens of different social habits otherwise he surely would not have strained probabilities as he does in the meetings and acquaintanceships that he asks us to accept an english journalist meets in new york a woman whose bosom friend is a boston woman the boston woman went to school in switzerland with the english aunt who controls the destinies of the girl to whom previously the english journalist is engaged why this unnecessary internationalism the contrast between kate croy's competent worldly intellect and the residuary innocence of spirit of milly thiel is simply a contrast between two different sorts of girls who might have been born in the same city any city from manchester to melbourne the intellectual girl lets herself go in a kind of desperate extravagance because the innocent girl does not quite follow her and so causes her some irritation she went at them just now these sources of irritation with an amused energy that it would have been open to milly to regard as cynical and that was nevertheless called for as to this the other was distinct by the way that in certain connections the american mind broke down 
it seemed at least the american mind as sitting there thrilled and dazzled in milly not to understand english society without a separate confrontation with all the cases well the intellectual portrait of our young women is wonderful you can see and hear those two girls together but it is one girl's mind and another girl's mind not american and english mind as embodied in two specimens in the foregoing passage it is not mr james but the english girl who imputes americanism to milly's mind but it seems to be his idea too and he notes the same thing elsewhere when he is writing more evidently without the intervention of an observant dramatis persona much of mr james's internationalism is an invention peculiar to him almost everything he alleges about a character seems true to human nature but he does not successfully nationalize one and another characteristic of the human mind it may be that daisy miller was a moral fish out of water and tragically perishing of fever be it noted not of innocence or moral contradictions but she was quite understandably that kind of girl and not inevitably a compatriot of mr howells's lydia blood or mr dreiser's jenny gerhardt or mrs wharton's lily bart if mr newman in the american had been an englishman the story would have gone just as well he does not do or say or think or possess a single nameable thing which necessitated his having been born in the united states whether the bellegarde family is recognizably and untransplantably french only a frenchman can tell us but it is worth remarking that whenever an english writing novelist wishes to work into a story some dark crime behind marvellous manners and fine breeding he gets french or italian or spanish people to play the villain for him except meredith who satirizes the english view of the french in beecham's career the moment an english novelist casually informs you that one of his characters had a french mother or that his name was sorrel but his grandfather was a wine merchant named sorolia you know right away that he will commit some crime before the book is done national characteristics are mainly superstitious held by aliens and not recognized by natives or by the thoroughly adopted newman has not a characteristic which is not american for nothing is un-american not even a preference for champagne without ice what is recorded of him by mr james as being peculiarly american does not strike at least one american as being so for example newman suspects the bellegarde family and he talks about them to his friend mrs tristram she is wicked she is an old sinner what is her crime asked mrs tristram i shouldn't wonder if she had murdered some one all from a sense of duty of course how can you be so dreadful sighed mrs tristram i am not dreadful i am speaking of her favorably pray what will you say when you want to be severe i shall keep my severity for some one else for the marquis there's a man i can't swallow mix the drink as i will and what has he done i can't quite make out it is something dreadfully bad something mean and underhand and not redeemed by audacity as his mother's misdemeanors may have been if he has never committed murder he has at least turned his back and looked the other way while some one else was committing it in spite of the invidious hypothesis which must be taken for nothing more than an example of the capricious play of american humor newman did his best to maintain an easy and friendly style of communication with m de bellegarde what newman says will have to be taken as something more than an example of the capricious play of american humor or as something quite other than american humor a human being from any part of the world might talk that way what newman says is not distinctly american in substance in tone in turn of phrase and there is one other thing the matter with it it is not humorous it is dead in earnest newman is seriously troubled and mr james so represents him at the moment and in the event but our author has americanisms on the brain and sees them when they do not exist mr james has lost what his brother calls connection with the open air of human nature human nature in its large common aspects 
not that he is untrue to human nature he is a remarkable penetrating student of it within a limited range of types and in social surroundings that are very narrow though they embrace half the cities of europe but he has not a broad knowledge of people his humanity is sometimes intense and exquisite it is not very hospitable he goes deep into some individuals not deep into society for all his unique originality he is a conventional man of the world as conventional as thackeray he is distinctly not a philosopher as man of letters professional craftsman he is a thorough workman as an interpreter of human life in its main issues he is a dilettante never even betraying that he understands or has ever questioned where newman verver and miss Thiel got their money and how or what supports the newspaper whose brazen reporter is so annoying what the newspaper means as a social force beyond the fact that a journalist is importunate in the presence of gentlemen mr james is not a snob because he has too much candour and good sense but he has never strayed imaginatively outside his own comfortable cultivated class some of his persons are uncultivated and some are impecunious but they are the poor and the vulgar of the upper crust not the real poor the real common majority he does not know as much as any one of fifteen younger novelists in england and america knows about all the principal economic and social varieties to be found in a single town he is almost morbid on the subject of vulgarity it is a fine trait to dislike vulgarity but it is not altogether wholesome to feel obliged to name it as vulgar every time one comes anywhere near it indeed it is a kind of vulgarity to be so uneasy about it it is not polite to flaunt one's wealth and it is not the largest most natural kind of elegance to betray a continuous consciousness of inelegance it is simpler to let things and people tell their own story unlabeled and to assume that the reader will know that this style of speech or that style of house furnishing is vulgar or is not mr james has two technical defects one of style the other of method the defect of style is due to his habit of writing with his eye and his mind instead of with his ear his great mind saves him perfectly when he is writing in his own person but too often when he makes a character speak he equips it with a peculiarly henry james sentence a fault not unlike browning's but more pardonable in a poet than in a writer of realistic fiction says kate croy we needn't i grant you in that case wait with all due deference to the author of her wonderful being what she would have said is i grant you that in that case we needn't wait folks talk that way in america and one stands on the testimony of other novelists in england of robert assingham a good straightforward military man mr james says he disengaged he would be damned if he didn't they were both phrases he repeatedly used his responsibility now he would be damned no doubt that sounds right but fancy his saying i disengage my responsibility to disengage one's responsibility is what a very full-worded man of letters does but not what a blunt and none too clever military man does she'll depreciate to you mrs assingham added your property that is in spoken english she'll depreciate your property to you added mrs assingham run down your property would be still better more lifelike mr verver an american business man is the hero of the following hiccuping row of phrases well i mean too he had gone on that we haven't no doubt enough the sense of difficulty the james sentence as a rule will be found upon scrutiny to contain admirably each thing in its place the entire idea and whatever another writer more naturally following the path of least resistance which on the whole is that path normally pursued by the human mind would tag on as who should say as an afterthought 
he cunningly and true to an ideally more perfect intellectual arrangement inserts or more properly builds in so that in fine to the english language is wonderfully restored in him some of the effect so long lost of the periodic sentence but people don't talk that way even the rather intellectual and delightfully clever human beings that he assembles the other defect that of method is the vice of his virtue he is critic of human life he devises an interesting situation and then stands off and explains it the good effect of this which no other novelist quite so curiously affords is a warrant of intellectual integrity as if he wanted the reader to watch the story with him discover things simultaneously with the author the difficulty is that having assumed that he does not know all about it but is a spectator too he then without any new action gesture or speech to furnish new knowledge plunges into the midmost mind of the character and tells things that are working there which only a god could know when daniel defoe narrating external events professes ignorance of something he plays a pretty game with the reader's credulity for the reader immediately claps the positive on the negative and concludes that what defoe does tell he does know all about this device is a good one to establish verisimilitude in an autobiographical narrative but it obviously is not successful applied to a novel in which the author deals with psychological processes known only to the omniscient creator what she was thinking of i am unable to say i hazard the supposition etc the reader's inner self retorts my dear sir you made her if you do not know you ought to or there is no use pretending that you knew all you told us a few pages back we confess says our author to having perhaps read into the scene prematurely a critical character that took longer to develop that sounds like candor and ought to strengthen the illusion that the writer is telling the whole truth and nothing but the truth as he knows it but its effect is quite otherwise it disturbs credulity ruffles illusion as when the theatre drop with the castle painted on it wavers in a gust from the wings anything is bad art which makes a reader say this is not so and mr james frequently does things in the talk of his characters and in his own comments which spoil the show in the turn of the screw he takes the governess's story out of her lips and retranslates it into an unconvincing idiom so that what ought to be a great tragic parable a ghost story even more terribly significant than ibsen's ghosts misses fire the more so in that the very nature of the story gives hostages to probability at the outset the plain fact is that many of mr james's stories do not sound true they are the work of a critic and they are interesting chiefly to those who like to follow with their intellects the wonderful process of his intellect this is especially the case with his later books which have perhaps unfortunately obscured those that made his reputation the first books roderick hudson the princess casamassima the portrait of a lady the american are straight away and simple how came it that the critic ran away with the novelist one reason it is safe to guess is that he lacks narrative material his mind is better than the intrinsic value of the subject he deals with he says highly intelligent and wise things about relatively unimportant situations the great novelists voluminous as they are make you feel that they are telling only part of what they know that there is a great life behind them mr james is like a great scientific mind imprisoned with a few bugs they are interesting bugs and he says wonderful things about them so long as the door is shut and one cannot hear the clamor of life outside one is content to study them with him unflaggingly fascinated the minute intricate fidelity of his observation is such that it taxes the full capacity of the reader's attention he is a chronicler of mental processes when there is process and an analyst of stationary mental states a good deal of the human intellect is comparatively static so that his work is often mere exposition 
unfolding rather than progressing it is a treat to watch him trace an idea to follow it as it swims up touched here by a motive there by a circumstance until it finally takes shape on the lips of a character because of his large if not predominant interest in the minds of his people he is called a psychologist he is a psychologist only so far as he is true to human nature all true portraits of human beings are psychologically true the story of joseph and his brethren no less than one of mr james's novels in most stories the motives are simplified and the actions elaborated in mr james the action is often subordinated to the meanings and the motives of it nine-tenths of what can be said about human beings by a sincere man seeking the truth is plain self-evident literature and life have already made it familiar so that it is instantly recognized when it is met again the other tenth is complex and cannot be briefly explained and it is with this tenth that mr james is eagerly engaged hence to people who do not receive a complicated idea mr james seems obscure in point of fact he is a paragon of clarity sharp precise and accurate with the kind of verbal justice which is characteristic of the french he is obscure only with the unavoidable obscurity that attends saying a new and difficult thing it is easier to narrate that a man killed his wife or put on his gloves than it is to say just how maggie verver met the stronger woman who menaced her married life once you get the total development of one of his characters you feel that you have passed all round it and proved that it is a real entity occupying space all the details have been touched in so that a complete knowledge finally closes round like a curve whose free ends meet at last and fulfil in a circle aside from the analysis and psychology and all that is forbiddingly intellectual some of the dramatic scenes in james's novels are remarkable inventions if the word scene suggests something too motor and theatrical then say rather the situations the human predicaments to tell one of his plots is hopelessly to spoil him for his reactions on the plots are what counts yet in order to indicate what an original relationship he can devise let us roughly suggest the situation in the golden bowl maggie verver is daughter of a rich american art collector she marries an italian prince just before the wedding there appears on the scene charlotte stant a friend of maggie's the prince and charlotte have been in love but unable to marry because they have not money enough they have one hour together unknown to maggie in which they go ostensibly for charlotte to buy maggie a wedding present into a curio shop there they see a golden bowl which charlotte admires the prince knows it is cracked after the wedding of maggie and the prince mr verver whose daughter has been his intimate companion is lonely he proposes to charlotte and is accepted only after they have telegraphed to maggie and the prince for their approval the prince and charlotte are thus thrown together the prince and his wife's stepmother maggie has known nothing of their past but she finds it out partly through the golden bowl and the curio dealer whom she stumbles on that outline which is too crude even to be an outline is sufficient to suggest the quadrangular situation compared to which the familiar triangular situation is child's play the working out of the story is at the lowest possible estimate a fascinating game of motives at the best estimate the one which is worthy of it it is very noble study of human character in his unemotional way mr james is a worshipper of what is fine in men and women he is somewhat timid in handling passion but he contrives to let you know that it is there off the stage but a vital part of the piece he is not a poet and that rather than any conviction of realism is probably the reason that the decided tendency to the romantic which he showed in his youth has not deepened but has almost entirely disappeared some of his titles especially the later ones are as symbolic as ruskin's but their symbolism is intellectual not poetic they are like all his metaphors of which he is prolific analogies contrived by the mind not 
the immediately sensational metaphors of the poet's vision they explain they elucidate but they do not flash on the ear or the eye they are the work of a man whose understanding is great but whose sense of beauty is not wonderful his is a critical intelligence turned into fiction as some undramatic poets turned to drama in shakespeare's time because drama was the thing doing he has not much of what may fairly be called the instinctive gift of narrative but his unusual intellect and fine artistic conscience have made him an object of intense admiration for his fellow craftsmen there are better story-tellers there are several living writers with a more natural ear for style there is not one whose mind is more interesting to encounter or who puts more sheer brains into his books biographical note henry james was born in new york city april fifteenth eighteen forty three he is a brother of william james the philosopher he was educated in europe and at the harvard law school since eighteen sixty nine he has lived in paris london italy and other places in europe his principal works are a passionate pilgrim eighteen seventy five transatlantic sketches eighteen seventy five roderick hudson eighteen seventy five the american eighteen seventy seven french poets and novelists eighteen seventy eight the europeans eighteen seventy eight daisy miller eighteen seventy eight an international episode eighteen seventy nine life of hawthorne eighteen seventy nine a bundle of letters eighteen seventy nine the madonna of the future eighteen seventy nine confidence eighteen eighty diary of a man of fifty eighteen eighty washington square eighteen eighty the portrait of a lady eighteen eighty one the siege of london eighteen eighty three portraits of places eighteen eighty four tales of three cities eighteen eighty four a little tour in france eighteen eighty four the author of beltraffio eighteen eighty five the bostonians eighteen eighty six the princess casamassima eighteen eighty six partial portraits eighteen eighty eight the aspern papers eighteen eighty eight the reverberator eighteen eighty eight a london life eighteen eighty nine the tragic muse eighteen ninety the lesson of the master eighteen ninety two the real thing eighteen ninety three picture and text eighteen ninety three the private life eighteen ninety three essays in london eighteen ninety three the wheel of time eighteen ninety three the spoils of poynton eighteen ninety seven what maisie knew eighteen ninety seven in the cage eighteen ninety eight the two magics eighteen ninety eight the awkward age eighteen ninety nine the soft side nineteen hundred the sacred fount nineteen hundred and one the wings of the dove nineteen hundred and three the ambassadors nineteen hundred and three the better sort nineteen hundred and three william w story and his friends nineteen hundred and four the question of our speech and the lesson of balzac nineteen hundred and five english hours nineteen hundred and five the american scene nineteen hundred and six italian hours nineteen hundred and nine julia bride nineteen hundred and nine the outcry 1912 end of section 21 end of the spirit of american literature by john albert macy